welcome all to the Town of Williston Development Review Board on Tuesday, October 8th. Uh, we will open the meeting at 7.04. Uh, first order of business is a public forum. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the board on an issue or topic that is not on tonight's agenda? Hearing none, uh, we will go into the first order of business. Uh, item two on the agenda to clarify uh, the DRB recommendations of DP 20-03 Pre-App Americo Real Estate Company and U-Haul International. Uh, Andy, good evening. If you would uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Andy Rowe, Lamer Owen Dickinson, 14 Morris Drive, Essex. Thank you. Uh, so you wrote a uh, correspondence. You are looking for um, additional detail as to what we were thinking on our, our conditions of approval from the last meeting. Yes, we had talked with staff and they suggested this is one avenue and I guess we're looking for some clarification on some of the additional recommendations. Are there must-haves in there? If some of them are addressed, does that make others less important or not applicable? Um, and in my notes, you know, we're not looking for the DRB to design the project, just I guess a prioritization of the additional recommendations and whether for example, if the 20-foot street tree spacing eliminates or makes some of the other recommendations less important. If, if one of those is implemented, does it eliminate the need for another, or are they all must-haves? That's basically what we're trying to get a handle on. Okay. Um, well, I uh, applaud you for coming in. Uh, this is a great way to do this. I, th I think that uh, I think that we'll just walk down item by item. However you want to do it, I realize this is a added agenda item and it's not a warned item, so we need to keep it focused and quick, so. So we'll, we'll just go through the, the items and uh, keep in mind that, uh, that these were DRB recommendations. Mm -hmm. so, um, so take them for, in the spirit of that. Uh, the east and west walls, item number nine, or condition of approval, item number nine. East and west walls are considered dead walls. Um, what we were thinking as a board is, is that um, although those east and west walls were architecturally activated, they were not activated to the level that we would like to see them activated given the size and scale of the wall and the proximity as in the gateway to Williston. And so we were looking for uh, some ad additional architectural interest be added. Um, are we, are, do we envision something of significance? Um, I speak up board, but I don't think we're I don't think we're looking for uh, the level of interest to be quadrupled, but we're, we're looking for some enhancement on those two sides. So, please. I, I, a couple things. You know, one, you know, because these are just comments and th these were recommendations from the board, individual viewpoints that you might hear are not necessarily the consensus the board would come to at, at a, a DP hearing. Understood. But, so I think you did a great start, though, of kind of yeah. generalizing kind of what the board was thinking. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the dead walls, just because there's a stripe in them doesn't mean they're not uniform. Mm -hmm. If that stripe goes 300 feet and it's not providing a lot of variation in that wall. If surface, any 30 foot section looks the same as the 30 foot section next to it. It goes on and on forever. Then, you know, then it's a pretty uniform treatment of that wall, I guess, is, is how I would look at that. So um, with the with the intersection of the mini storage unit building on the oops, on this wall, is that west wall still a concern with that building intersecting it, limiting the visibility of that entire wall from Willison Road? Well, I, guess, I think 
I think that ties into the the answer to your question is maybe. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny with that. It's it's maybe because um, one of our other recommendations that we'll get to as we go through these in order um, was to do something with the mini storage and move it to the. Our recommendation was to move it into the back of the property, and so if if you were to implement that recommendation, then that wall would or could be potentially fully exposed. And so I think some of it depends upon what action you take on our recommendation as it applies to moving the mini storage into a less visible portion of the site. Okay. That leads right into the second one, which was reconfiguring the site so that many storage units are not visible from Route 2. Yeah. So the thinking, the thinking from the board there is that um, we're, we're really trying to be protective of, of the, the first building that people come to in Williston along Route 2, while also being respectful of your rights, your client's rights as a landowner and, and following the, um, the bylaws that we all, that, which are the rules of engagement that we all need to adhere to. So um, we were trying to be respectful of, of both of those um, uh, which, which don't necessarily work in harmony sometimes. And so what we were, what we were hoping for is uh, some creative rearranging on the site uh, to still have your business model succeed um, while lessening the visual impact from Route 2. So it's not simply eliminating the doors that face Route 2 on the main building. It also has to do with the individual standalone mini storage buildings as well? No, it, it actually has to do solely with the individual units. Okay. And if that wasn't clear in our, in, our, in our staff report, I apologize for that. But it, it ha do you have a site plan that you can put up, please, Andy? Well, the, so the doors, there are some mini storage units in the first level of the yep. building where those doors face Route 2, and that's what we were wondering, whether those were the concern or whether it was the buildings, which are perpendicular, so the storage units themselves are less visible, but it's, it's that type it's of building, stand, obviously. It's the standalone. It's the standalone storage units that yeah. that, that note was intended to address. But I think Pete brought up the uh, correct observation that you know th this this is a gateway building into this into Williston, and so we are concerned with how that this building is perceived as you proceed down Route Two and approach Williston. So, you know, you can say that they're they're perpendicular, and yet the only time you see a short perpendicular end of that building is you know if you if you turn 90 degrees as you drive by it. 30 miles an hour, which is pretty fast. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the side, you actually get a longer view of it, an angle as you approach, because mm -hmm. you can have a constant view of that. That's why signs tend to be not parallel with the road, but perpendicular to it. So those are our concerns. And I think, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to have the, the next application kind of address how that building looks as you approach it. I think that's, I think that's really a key to a lot of the comments that we had here. Yeah. Oh. What one question I that came up after driving by the site location was the elevation of the road compared to the elevation of the lot there is the road quite a bit lower at that point than what the building site would be. I didn't want to get into new testimony, but uh, yes. So is you're heading toward Taft's Corners, the road's coming up, the site is relatively level. Is you get past the house uh, and up into the area where the driveway will be located, you'll be at, you know, plus or minus a foot, same elevation as the road. As you get closer to the industrial lab intersection, um, there's a definite grade difference between the site and Willison Road. And again, not, 
I don't want to get into new testimony, but as you're headed towards staff's corners, if there was additional screening added in here, combined with the topography, you're going to have fairly limited view of that end of the site. Obviously, coming from Taft's Corners headed towards South Burlington, it's going to be somewhat the opposite. Right. Right. And that was one reason I had asked previously for the, the perspective views from both, from both directions there. I think that's you know, the, the best, the, the more you can model what that's really going to look like, I think it would be helpful for all of us to kind of not imagine what it's going to be, but actually talk, you know, evaluate what's what's being proposed here. We, we're viewing this as a as a serious a project. It's a big, it's an important project at, at this location. So, but I guess understanding that point from the board is important because I think that is a major element for them if they've got <clears throat> if they've got to put the mini storage units on the side or behind the building. That obviously displaces what they've currently got on the side and behind the building. So. They're going to have to make a decision on whether they can live with that or not. Or, or if you can come up with some, um, some creative screening, keep the build, keep the mini storage where it is, but come up with some uh, additional screening that's right next to those mini storage buildings. There's 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 many ways to to do this. Certainly. And, uh, one of the things that we try to avoid is to be um, to, to to dictate the the design modifications, and um, so we're really lo looking for uh, for for you to do that, and for us to convey our thoughts as to what we were what we were thinking when we wrote that condition of approval. Understood. Edge material. Think of a twelve-month type. Again, that's something for them to consider because I think I'd mentioned in the notes here, visibility is important for them. So right, it's a big building. There's a lot there that is visible. So pick the most important parts, maybe. Yeah, and, and just and think about it from the perspective of um, you can still maintain visibility. So that if you're driving on Route 2, you still know what it is and you still clearly can identify the purpose and the business intent while, um, while creating some buffer for a portion of that elevation. So it doesn't have to disappear because, you know, I think that and uh, if, if I misrepresent from anyone here, just please chime in. But I, I don't think the intent is, you know, to put up this, this, this big wall that you can't see anything behind the wall. It's, that's not the intent. No, you could, ha you could have the equivalent if you say that the lot is slightly higher than the road, right? Correct. So if you had, like, say, just a six-foot kind of hedge, that covered the section where the uh, mini storage was, the people won't see that, but they will still see the top of that. Your that would be building. entirely dependent on what it actually looked like and what that image is. I, I would say I would have an impossible time saying that that's true from right here, with my eyes closed, imagining what you're describing. So I think we need to we need to comment on what they're actually proposing. Yeah. No, no. I'm just saying though, as a as a as an option, if they had a hedge, but, but a we're height, we're, gonna, we're gonna stay away from designing. Okay. Okay. Because uh, cause that's not what we do. Is, is our uh, explanation of what we are thinking of, item number 10, is that sufficient for you, Andy, yes. at this point? Okay. Okay, item number 11. Uh, tone down colors and use earth tone colors. So um, the elephant in the room is, is... The orange. Is Sierra Sunset, do we consider that to be... Um, to be an earth tone color, no, we don't. And I mean, we could argue about whether that's in the earth tone color hues and all that. And and right. I'm not interested in having that conversation. We just we we um, really are looking for something more subtle. It's too much orange. Too much orange. That's what we're looking for. There's a yeah. lot of contrast on that building, especially between the orange and the other colors on the building. 
So, so we're not. So we're not saying that. Uh, and, and I understand U-Haul's brand. I understand uh, their color theme. Um, I think it's it's pretty universally recognized, and there's a lot of power in that brand. We're not we're not saying that there can't be any. Let's just call it orange. <clears throat> There can't be any orange on the building. Um, it's just that those those doors, um, <laughs> in, in contrasting doors. with the the exterior elevation, um, is is uh, more than we are comfortable with. John mentioned the contrast. If and I'm not. I'm not putting something in front of you, so I know it's difficult to comment on, but if there's less contrast, if the other colors were darkened <coughs> so that there was less contrast between the orange and the, the main color, color of the building, is that going in the right direction, or is it simply the, the brightness of the orange? I mean, to answer that question, you'd probably have to pull each one of us and see, if, you know, and, and now we're starting to get into it. I wasn't even thinking state, of it until but, you mentioned it. So. Right. I mean, so, you know, I think you'd have to take the comments that are here and judge that um, you know at some point you're going to have another proposal in front of us and we're going to listen to it and then we're going to deliberate whether that that it adequately meets what we're looking to, to approve or what we can approve is it also worth noting I mean just per our discussion with the canopy the gas canopy over by James Brown Drive that that orange could be considered part of the sign the signage the signage when it's just asking kind of a, an open question but when you have it as the background of a text or logo, you start to have that question. So it's kind of like the, the gas station Pump Island question of, you know, a, a two colors that are both corporate colors with a logo that uses the same colors on top of it. What do you call the sign? The bylaw says it's the logo or text plus the background. So um, an orange door, you know, off by itself with no copy on it, I don't think you can ever measure that as part of the sign, but a, a orange band on the building and in, you know, one eighth of it, it, it says U-Haul. Yes, you, you could make an argument for measuring that entire surface as, as the sign. But if it was just a panel that was U-Haul orange, that wouldn't count necessarily as a sign, as part of the... It's a lot, it's a lot harder to do that because it's, it's hard to say that is truly carrying a, a commercial message. On your contrast question, I think it's something that would certainly be discussed amongst the group once you've presented it as part of a reasonable response to our comments. Okay. The next one, reducing the mass of the building, is seen from Route 2. This was one that, you know, we talked about <clears throat> potentially relocating the storage units. If those are moved, if the colors are changed, is the massing of the building addressed or does the massing of the building is that still expected to be addressed? Um, it, it might be addressed with the colors being toned down. And what we, but what we were envisioning there with the massing was not to, not to reduce the, the building massing by 20%. It was more to do um, some, some architectural um, architectural features and architectural elements that make the building seem smaller. And, um, and John, can, as an architect, can speak to this uh, perhaps well, be better than... I could, than but it would be a couple-hour lecture. <laughs> well, I'm not interested in <laughs> no, that. No, neither am I. <laughs> um, not but, unprepared. But that's, but. What, but that's what we were... That's what we were envisioning, Andy, is is not reducing the building by 20% or 30%, not that type of massing reduction. We were looking to, um, to do something that creates visually the appearance of less massing. And I, if I could, I, I think number 16 and 17 on here got us, we, we ventured a little close to doing some design work and kind of being more specific about that. in terms of the greater variety of building materials and, the, and varying the height of the parapet. I think you, you could take those as perhaps a couple of suggestions on ways we might be right. open to. We were leaning forward a little on that topic. Okay. That makes sense. 
Yep. So I like the idea of your answer to number 12. The idea of the 20, the 20 foot tree does from the road breaks up and when the guy's looking because he's going to see, you know, not just this huge building, but he's going to see a building with the tree in front and another part of the building, tree in front. So I like, I like your answer there. Well, that was actually a condition. The 20? Well, same thing. I like that too. Um, the steadies is, the steadies is no right, issue. I think we're on the same page on yep. steadies. Landscaping along Route 2, we were looking for um, uh, for the spacing required by the bylaws to be um, to, to to be 20 feet. I mean, it's 40 feet in the in the bylaws, and we're looking for it to be 20 feet for the reasons that Paul just cited to try to create some visual um, some visual element to that. But I think you had commented earlier that you're not expecting a, a wall of, of landscaping. You're looking, you understand there's going to be visibility of the site. Yep. But yeah. yep. with appropriate screening. Yep. Okay. We're, not, we're not trying to block out the building. That's not what we're suge suggesting. But, but we are concerned about it being this behemoth that is sitting there greeting everyone as a... Our only concern there was, you know, putting in sufficient landscaping that it meets the purpose in the first year and then having that mature over three to five years and at that point you've got landscaping that goes much further in limiting the visibility of the site and we didn't want to get into a situation where the site's in conflict with its permit because they go out in thin shrubs. But I think you've provided comments that address that earlier in the discussion, so. Um, 15, as far as the future 20 additional parking spaces, if in fact you were just looking for those to be identified on the site so that there's ample room to accommodate those should the needs arise, we got it. Great. Um, and I guess if there's anything to add on 16 and 17 other than the, the earlier reference that 16 and 17 apply back to reducing the appearance of the size of the building, We'll, we'll take those as intended. I look forward and, to the creativity of your designers. And if I can just add, not just to reduce the appearance of the size, but to make it architecturally interesting so that it's not, it doesn't look like a strip mall or, or just like a, I mean, I, I think there's ways to make the building more architecturally appealing than, than what has been proposed. So, those features, 16 and 17, would make it more interesting from my perspective and isn't just to address massing. Does that make sense? It does. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think how to phrase this appropriately um, because I know the question that they're going to come back with is that this is in, in an industrial zoning district. Um, they have no problem designing to the community standard and you know the I don't want to compare it to the, the building across the street or the buildings between the town line and this building um, but I guess all of these comments are looking for a nice looking building in the industrial zoning district not a building that you might expect to see another thousand feet down on Willison Road in a different zoning district. We don't have the ability to influence what has been built, and and I'm not suggesting that 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 should hold back additional development. I'm just that I mean this is probably going to be not that it can't have stone facade similar to another building at the corner of Commerce and and Willison Road, but it's not going to look like something in the Taft's Corner zoning district. I think you're I think you're on track and you know I, I look at this I look at this process a little bit like the process that we went through with the healthy living building that um, came in for uh, in front of the DRB earlier this summer and different 
zoning district, different building, different location, a whole bunch of different circumstances, but the spirit of the conversation was similar in that um, the, the Development Review Board was not trying to uh, prevent that building from proceeding, nor are we trying to prevent uh, the U-Haul project from proceeding. We're trying to make it, um, make it a, as, as, as nice a building within the zoning district that is reasonable. And um, I know we could all debate what that means, but that's really the spirit of what we're trying to do here. Understood. And, and I think the, the context and the site makes a difference. If it's in the middle of the woods and all, it's a lot different than right here where it is. Can you just repeat that again? I was, I was following that, that the context and the location of where this site is makes a difference. And it, 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 it it's invites in a visible it, spot. It's an extremely visible location. It's in a sensitive uh, location for our town. Okay. I, I hope this was helpful. It was. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank for squeezing you. us into the agenda. Okay. We're going to close uh, the clarification recommendations on DP 20-03 at 729. Uh, next order of business is final plan review for DP 18-06. Vermont Hotel Group, LLC. Is that, uh, is that something that we do in a public hearing or? It's not a hearing. Okay. Uh, it's just an, it's an open session agenda item. Okay. So um, we have received final plans for the Blair Park Hotel and um, find them in order with all of the conditions of approval imposed by the DRB and um, by, by reference conditions that came out of Public Works and other uh, departmental comments and do recommend approval of those plans. Um, and you can see a response from the applicant's engineer attached to the little staff report there that just uh, enumerates some of the ways in which the plans were adjusted. You, you may recall uh, briefly there was some confusion over uh, showing all of the landscaping. Some of it is uh, related to drainage swales and stormwater treatment. Some of it is related to more traditional landscaping. Taken together, the final plans reflect the DRB's requirements and the um, representations made by the applicant throughout the review process. So staff is recommending signature on those plans. And there's just a brief motion prepared for you to consider for that. Okay. So the... Uh so the DRB retained final plan approval. Yes. Yeah. Application. Okay. Okay. The material samples are um, available as well. Thanks, you read my mind, Emily. <laughs> you can pass those down. I'm not going to pass this one down because it's really heavy. <laughs> but it's got the stone. You can see it. I still don't know where it's How it's going to fit? Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a brick sample over there. You can just hold it up. <laughs> So, yeah, you might recall that the intent is to try to be somewhat similar to the stone detail next door. Oh, yeah, right. Nice. That's good. Is this, is this a 91 or 92 room hotel? It says both in here. That's a good question. <laughs> well, well, it says 96 in the uh, agenda. Well, it was 96. The agenda that I accidentally copied into this was the original one, which was 96. And then to do accommodate the floor plan, it got reduced to like 92 or 94. Yeah. Cover letter says 91. It says 91. Abby, are you confident that it's a 91? I can hear about it. Yeah, it's 91. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions? 
questions from the board uh, on this topic? Who would we ask? <laughs> well, you'd ask, you'd ask us, or, or you'd ask to yeah, see the plan. Ask, right. Yeah, we'd start with staff. Yeah. Did you have anything that you saw that didn't seem to jive with what the conditions of approval were? No, we looked through the landscaping to make sure, because it is shown, um, some of the landscaping shown on the landscaping plan, and others are shown in the stormwater catchment basin, so we flipped through and compared those. <coughs> Okay. Uh, hearing no further questions for staff, uh, we will close DP 18 06 at 734. Uh, next up, DP 20 11 South Burlington Realty uh, Discretionary Permit. Good evening, Abby and Tim. If you would state your name and address, please, for the record. Um, hi, I'm Abby Derry from Trudell Consulting Engineers. I'm Tim McKenzie with South Burlington Realty Company. Okay, staff goes first. All right. Um, this is a request for a discretionary permit. Um, the request is to permit ongoing construction staging and outdoor storage and two, to perform a boundary line adjustment between lot five and 182 Winter Sport Lane. This is all taking place in the industrial zoning district west. Um, the parcels are currently developed with an access drive and some site clearing, and the activities as discussed there are sort of underway. If you were to go by, you would see construction equipment, materials, et cetera. Um, this is the first time the DRB is reviewing this request. Um, Due to the scale of the proposed project for approval under this, a pre-application review is not required. Um, staff has prepared a development and permit history for the site for the DRB. Um, there were some past permits for sand and gravel extraction and renewal of those. Um, uh, a subdivision. Um, and site plan approval for lot one of the subdivision, which was completed, um, and a three-lot commercial industrial subdivision in 1994. Um, there's always been some level of extraction and construction equipment there and in and out of the site. Um, but in May of 2019, I, as zoning administrator, observed there had been a significant uptick in activity and observed some erosion impacts, uh, sedimentation impacts to nearby stream coming out of the property. And I did issue a notice of zoning violation requesting that the applicant uh, cease the unpermitted activity on the site and provide an application for discretionary permit to designate areas on the site for outdoor storage, provide landscape screening buffers, delineate wetlands on the site, and uh, establish an erosion protection and sediment control plan for the site. And so this application is the response to um, that action by me back in May. Um, and so did activity cease upon issuance of that notification? No, not, not in my observation. They've, they've been more or less ongoing since May. Uh, we, we were informed relatively quickly um, by Trudell Engineering that South Burlington Realty had engaged them as a client to pursue permitting for the site. That happened within, within a week of issuing the violation. So they've been in, they've been in process on that. Um, I will also note we do have a pre-application request scheduled for October 22nd, the DRB's next meeting, to do some other development work um, on this same subject property to reconfigure the Hammerhead um, road on the site, consolidate internal boundary lines, and to propose development on lot two of the subdivision. Um, the applicant is submitting this permit first as a standalone to clear up and resolve the zoning violation before requesting approval for additional development on the site. So the proposed use um, in this 
in this action is construction staging and outdoor storage construction is an allowed use in the zoning district there are no changes to access proposed lots two three five and six are accessed from munson drive which is a private drive with a curb cut on williston road munson drive was platted as a private road with a hammerhead um, because the original subdivision was anticipating industrial developments on each parcel in the subdivision so at this time and under this application there are no new structures proposed the storage and staging areas are uncovered there's no new site work proposed the applicant however has proposed landscaping and wetland delineation on the site as part of this application the applicant is proposing a boundary line adjustment this would convey 0 0.9 acres from 182 winter sport lane to lot 5 months and drive both of these parcels are owned by south burlington realty um, currently there's some of that construction uh, staging activity encroaching onto the 182 winter sport lane lot so this this would be up in the the north um, northeastern portion of the site if you were looking at the site plan uh, there's no outdoor lighting existing or proposed and then we go into our discussion of setbacks so uh, development in williston generates a requirement for a setback usually uh, achieved with a landscape buffer as identified in the table in the staff report and then the applicant has proposed some buffers uh, along the edges of the individual lots as noted in the report so on lot six you have a 50 foot wide type one buffer which means existing wooded vegetation along the northern boundary and a nine foot wide type three buffer along the western boundary um, they would retain existing vegetation and also enhance the vegetation along that western boundary on lot five the applicant would install a new nine foot wide type three buffer that's dense plantings the the traditional row of um, arborvitae type vegetation on that eastern boundary where the parcel abuts 182 winter sport lane and then a 50 foot wide type one existing vegetation buffer where it abuts a residential property lot three the eastern boundary abuts a residential property the existing wooded area and class two wetland would meet and exceed the requirements for that type one existing vegetation buffer along that boundary then um, along the exterior parcel boundaries you have a summary there of those buffers and the definitions of those buffer types quoted in the staff report um, normally we would require street trees along williston road uh, as as the board was just discussing in the u-haul application across the street um, here if you look at the site you note that the wetlands on the site are right adjacent to williston road and there's a there's a pretty steep embankment coming down there there's really uh, an, in staff's estimation nowhere to to put some kind of a street tree section there uh, we're not looking at this application as generating any requirement for parking as noted there are class two wetlands on lots two three and five they were delineated in june of 2019 um, there has been some encroachment into the 50-foot wetland buffers by the construction staging and equipment storage the applicant is proposing to install a silt fence uh, and restore those disturbed lands in the wetland buffer with landscaping the site plan they've submitted identifies a final stabilization plan with seating specifications um, right now the proposal is for a barrier tape to delineate the wetland buffer and you know essentially a no mow line uh, this project did receive recommendations from the conservation commission under their review they suggested permanent fencing or a row of boulders in that location to delineate that buffer um, in terms of traffic this development like all others can be subject to traffic impact fees assessed by the administrator at the time of the issuance of an administrative permit in terms of signage there is no new signage proposed the applicant is proposing to relocate the existing freestanding sign on the site outside of the wetland buffer um, in terms of stormwater this site does have a state stormwater permit for 4.55 acres imp of impervious surface and at this time there are no water or wastewater connections proposed um, outdoor storage is a component of this application the applicants proposing the keeping of equipment and materials and staging areas on each lot um, staff is recommending approval of outdoor storage in the location shown on the plan um, the, there's not any screening of that outside storage currently proposed um, the board may decide if a condition of approval is necessary as it relates to the requirements of 36.7.2 as quoted in the staff report so at this time the staff has not prepared a condition if the drb wants one 
uh, you'll need to come up with it. Lots two and three in this subdivision do abut Williston Road and are therefore subject to the design review requirements of chapter 22. Um, this application, because there's no buildings proposed, was not reviewed by the Historic and Architectural Advisory Committee. Uh, applications for development where there are structures proposed would, would receive that review. Um, but most of the criteria there do apply to buildings um, and not other um, elements of the site. There is um, a short list there in the staff report of criteria that would apply to this project. Um, they're, they're very similar to the ideas expressed in 3672 about screening your outdoor storage. And so again, for the board to look at those requirements and determine uh, if and where any additional screening is necessary to meet the standards of the bylaw. Public comment, no comment letters or emails were received at the time of our packet mail out, which was October 3rd, 2019, nor have we received any since then. We did distribute this application for comment to the police, fire, and public works departments of the town. Um, we did not receive comment from police or fire. Public works did write a comment memo, which is attached to your staff report. Uh, they wanted to know the state's stormwater permit number. That number is reported in the staff report. Uh, know where the outdoor storage locations were. Understand the amount of impervious area for the lots, um, including outdoor storage. And noted that public work standards for a road terminal uh, do indicate a cul-de-sac. This project was reviewed by the Conservation Commission, primarily due to the presence of wetlands on the site. And their report is attached and their recommendations are drafted as conditions of approval below. And as I mentioned, the main one relates to delineating wetland buffers with something um, like fencing or boulders. So that said, um, staff is recommending that this permit can be approved with recommended findings of fact, conclusions of law, and conditions of approval as provided in the staff report. And again, noting that if there are additional conditions necessary by determination of the DRB to achieve outdoor storage screening, wetland delineation materials, or meeting the design cri review criteria on lots two and three, the board would need to draft those. And I will stop there. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, Abby and Tim, uh, walk us through your thoughts. So yes, the application before you is to, for continued use of the lot for construction, staging, and outdoor storage. Um, we had initially come in with a, a plan to Williston to do some development at lot two and three and approve the construction staging at one time, um, but that proved to be the wrong sequence of events. So we submitted solely the application for discretionary approval of the activity that's happening on site. Um, and that's why we're here tonight to talk about this. Um, we'd like to, um, a pretty large amount of lots three, five, and six are taken up by those um, activities. There are um, base material stockpiles, construction equipment, um, barriers um, on lots three, five, and six. We're proposing the appropriate landscape buffers um, between this lot and adjacent lots. And um, I guess that's where we are right now. The applicant has demarcated the wetland buffer with barrier tape now. They have silt fence down slope of all the disturbance activities in place um, and are open to having a permanent um, wetland buffer demarcation as recommended by the Conservation Have you looked at the draft uh, recommended conditions of approval? Is there, is there anything in those conditions that causes you pause? Um, we can, you know, I, I read through these and I think we can, uh, we definitely can um, comply with all of these conditions. We can incorporate those into the final plans. Okay. Uh, staff report cites a $200 a day violation that's been accruing since the end of May. 
what is the applicant's position on that topic? Um, my being here is a little unique in that South Burlington Realty is now the owner of the land. It was owned by Munson Earth Moving until Mr. Munson's passing. Um, so I was not completely familiar with the permis, permit status. I know that they truly believe that they were permitted to do what they were doing. What started out 35 years ago as an extraction permit where they would extract sand and make a pile and then maybe have some leftover material from a job and you know leave some leftover material next to that sand pile. And I think over the course of 35 years, that has morphed uh, into certainly more than what was permitted and, and it wasn't malicious, but to um, stop all activity as of May 31st would have put Munson Earth moving out of business. Um, I, I, I think they tried to stop doing activity towards the front of the lot, which caused which got Matt's attention, um, but like I said, they, w without the access to their materials in their piles, they would have been out of business through the summertime. Okay. If I understand right, there, there was a 30-day period with, within which they could have appealed, is that? Sure. And that would the clock called it the accrual of the two hundred dollars a day. Is that how that would work? Well, it, it, it depends on which way the appeal would go. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background in terms of Williston's history of performing zoning enforcement. Two hundred dollars a day is the statutory amount of money that zoning administrators are allowed to assess against any any violation of local zoning. Typically. Um, the matter of, the, of a fine, the negotiation of a fine or the payment fine in the whole time I've been in Williston um, has only come up once we've actually had to take somebody to court to obtain compliance with um, a violation letter, which often happens after sort of years and years of non-compliance. And typically the amount of that fine starts at the $200 a day and, and is then negotiated between the parties and, and ultimately, because it's a, at that point you're in a legal settlement between the select board and the, um, the violating party, um, Williston's history around that has generally been to advise um, fines that cover the town's legal costs where it has incurred them in having to go out and, and enforce a violation. So. Um, Two hundred dollars a day is—it's a statutorily supported number. It gets people's attention. Um, it rarely results in an actual bill to somebody to pay. Um, but if you get ninety-five percent of the way to compliance, and then and then things kind of go off the rails again, it does give you a stronger um, leverage point to make sure that compliance gets taken all the way through. So in this particular case, the applicant. Uh, quickly upon being notified, uh, engaged TCE and, and started working towards what we are ultimately seeing tonight. That's correct. Okay. Were there any other changes in the activities on site that, that reduced the, uh, the level of violation? I believe they stopped their activity towards the front of the site. Um, and in, the, in the, the rear of the site, they continue to have their sand pile, and I think they have a, a topsoil pile and probably a couple of gravel piles back there, which they use throughout the course of the summer. Which, which parts of their activities were in violation of the... <laughs> well, so we, we don't have a good permit record um, with going going past about the mid-1980s as it relates to gravel extraction and some associated activities. The, the way the site has been used since then is, is not all that out of line with what we might see in lots of places in the industrial zoning district and, and in lots of um, gravel, gravel mining operations. Um, if, if I were to uh, be in a court of law sort of fighting or negotiating this violation, 
one of the things that would likely come up would be, well, how much of what's out there right now has been going on since, since more than 15 years ago, um, which, is, which is Vermont's statutory limitation on all claims on land. If you, know, if you go by the site every day for 15 years and see the violation and don't do anything, eventually there's, there's a right to, to basically continue with that violation that can be awarded. So there's always been some level of activity on that site, certainly for the last dozen years that I've been observing it. What I observed in May was a significant increase and was starting to have some actual impact um, off-site vis-a-vis sedimentation in, this, in the uh, drainage swale along uh, Williston Road. So we, we write the letter, uh, we get a call from TCE saying we're, we're taking this on, we're gonna work towards a permit. Um, I also did observe uh, activities you know, moved to the rear of the site and silt fence installed fairly quickly along that wetland boundary. So Thank you. that's where we're at. Thank you. That's helpful. So in other words, they didn't appeal, but they complied. They took steps toward compliance. Toward compliance. Okay, that's it. Um, temp you, most of the staging is labeled temporary. Do you mean, like, um, is that what kind of material will go in those areas? Is it just uh, fill, sand, gravel, or is it actual equipment that will go in those temporary areas? Uh, there is some equipment there. Um, the materials are typically, you know, stuff that they will they will reuse. You know, so there's different size gravel piles. There's topsoil. There's sand. Yeah, it's not. It's not like machinery or it's gravel. Well, and some of the staging in the back looks like it is equipment? You know, some of the things that they are storing back there is they, they do have some Jersey barriers and they do have um, various size buckets. Um, swap out on a front end loader. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. So am I understanding the site plan correctly that, that pretty much the the hatched area is, is what's being proposed as an area available for outdoor storage? Yes. I, mean, you could, I think it's labeled as staging, but that's really, we could, we could call that outdoor, outdoor storage, storage area. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the label temporary sta staging or was because I don't know what's going to be there. I, you know, I don't know exactly what's going to be parked in that area, so things will come and go as Munson needs. Is Munson a lessee? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Is Munson a lessee? Do they lease? From yes. Okay. So uh, they're, they're you know, it, it's a, it, it's a, a close relationship. they the, the extent of their lease is basically pay the property taxes. Like I said, the property was owned by Munson. Upon Mr. Munson's passing, the property was taken out of their ownership and put, in, put into the trust controlled by South Raleigh Realty. So it's kind of their property as long as they pay the property tax for their operation. Does that answer your question a bit? You're the only one that has a chance of understanding. No, I, I, I followed, well, it sounds like it's owned by the trust. Uh, the, the assets are owned by a trust, correct. I was kind of curious is on, on the on the one side of lot six that goes up against the uh, parking lot and on the back of six that goes up towards the other parking lot. What is the slope on that out of curiosity? It's very steep. What's the chance of erosion just out of curiosity? It's all, it's all yeah, vegetated. It's wooded right now. Wooded and vegetated. They're not proposing to remove anything. How stable is that sand in there right now? I don't believe they're doing uh, any more extraction. Okay. They have piles left. Oh, so they're, they're primarily just using this as a staging place then. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So no more digging, digging. No more digging. Okay. David? Just for clarification, lot one, is the Aston Johnson building that's listed on here that says? Uh, no, lot one is the Williston or uh, uh, Vermont discount stores. Okay. Just a, the other one is actually labeled as lot one. Yeah, up yeah. behind lot one is the Aston Johnson. Okay. Aston Johnson is the former lot four. Uh, that's right. 
So that was the question that's been begging to be asked. <laughs> Where the heck what is lot happened four? to lot four? Mm -hmm. So that so that was formerly lot four and it's owned by another. It's been sold. Okay. All right. Thank you. By the applicant are two, three, five, and six. Correct. Okay. We'll as, well, as well as the adjacent parcel that's being made smaller to add to this by the boundary line adjustment. Right. The winter sport. Yes, that we uh, we um, developed that as fully as we could with uh, additional extra space storage units. That's another one of our related businesses. It appears that some of the um, structures are in the right of way for Munson Way. Is that a public street, Munson Way? No. No. Private. Private. Lane. Private drive, yeah. And so the public works is coming about the the cul de sac that you're not proposing to put a cul de sac. I'm not proposing to put a cul de sac, so maybe that is one I would like to discuss with you. Is there a need to have a, a cul-de-sac at the end of this road when the only, really the only thing served by the private road is the lot one warehouse building? There's not multiple businesses at the end of this road. This was originally going to be an industrial subdivision, um, but when sewer didn't pan out in this location, that sort of went to the wayside and those lots were never sold off. And, um, the, the, other challenge, developed. the other challenge with future development of this site is that the sewer line is up at the top of the hill up by winter sport lane and so um, it's currently working just fine as serving months and earth moving and we other than potentially additional extra space storage units in the front lot that don't require sewage um, it'll continue to operate as it is it's just not feasible to pump it up the hill yeah just a it's a pretty big expense for a modest sized building disproportionate most likely i will note um, in regards to road configuration you know we do require in um, a couple places in the bylaw that private roads meet current public road specifications that do come out of the public works specs that said uh, you have a planted subdivision with a hammerhead terminus um, this may remind some folks in a recent residential subdivision um, that had, was in a similar situation in which the town demanded a cul-de-sac and, and lost in state environmental court. Um, so once you have a platted subdivision, your, your ability to require a reconfiguration of a platted street is somewhat limited. Um, that's, that's been our experience and that might be the, the planning staff's advice back to Public Works is just to recall that um, <laughs> I don't really want to go back to the Costello Courthouse again to talk about cul-de-sacs and, and hammerheads if I don't have to. Where, where the hammerhead is, is is actually an artifice in one sense because the trucks can drive almost anywhere in that hard pack back there, correct? That's correct. They, they, so have, they, they actually have a little loop road back there. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So in other words, the hammerhead per se is more for someone drawing pictures than for actual use at this point. Correct. Is there any, do any of these maps show the proposed boundary line adjustment between lot five and 182 and where the, the old line is and where the new line will be? Yeah, I think there was. Yeah, see where the existing lines are. The proposed line. Um, it's just right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it's going to be this whole chunk.
questions? Yeah. I'm good. You're good? Anything else to add? Okay. Uh, thank you for coming. We're going to close DP 20 11 at 8.04. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Next up is DP 16-05.1, uh, Cottonwood Crossing, Phase 1, Amendment Number 1. Welcome all. Thank okay. you. Hi. You would please uh, start with you, Al, and work your way towards Bill and give your name and address, please. Um, Al Seneca with Allenbrook Development, 31 Congress South Burlington. I'm Mike Lawrence, I'm with the I'm uh, Dan Heil uh, with O'Leary Burke Civil Associates, 13 <coughs> Corporate Drive, Essex. Uh, Brian Birch, Allenbrook Development, 31 Commerce Ave, South Burlington. Bill Gardner, Gardner, Kilcoin Architects, 147 Allenbrook Lane, Williston. Thank you and welcome. Uh, staff goes next. Sure. Um, first of all, uh, there are two um, applications here related to Cottonwood, one for the Phase One amendment and the other for Phase Two. Um, just as a note of clarification, um, these both appeared as a single pre-application um, previously, and so I'll be referring to um, the pre-application. For, for each of these two applications, but it was the same. Same pre-app. Yeah, right. they've just been separated uh, just for clarity. Um, so this is a request for discretionary permit review of a, of a proposal to amend a previously approved mixed-use development located at 6180 and 6226 Williston Road in the mixed-use residential zoning district. Cottonwood Crossing has undergone multiple stages of review for a five-phase mixed-use development consisting of 72,130 square feet of commercial space and 173 dwelling unit equivalents. Uh, this request is to amend phase one of the overall development. Phase one includes the development of the northeast portion of the site with three buildings, A buildings A1, B1, and C1, and associated parking, and um, the buildings contain 19,335 square feet of retail commercial space, 10,110 square feet of office space, 6,225 square feet of restaurant space, 15 one-bedroom and 31 two-bedroom dwellings as proposed. Underground parking is proposed under buildings A1, B1, C1, and C1, all three of the buildings included in phase one of the development. <clears throat> the current proposal for phase one involves, uh, the phase one amendment involves a design change to the A1 building, a footprint change to the B1 building, a reduction in one bedroom dwelling units from 15 to 11, the addition of storefront windows on the north and east sides of the B1 building, and some minor changes to the on street parking and phase one parking area to improve circulation. No changes in the C1 building are proposed. The subject property was formerly the site of a driving range and is currently undergoing development of Cottonwood Crossing Phase 1. Um, the project history is as follows. The DRB previously approved this project on August 13, 2019 as a pre-application. 
recommendations made by the DRB at the pre-application and the applicant's responses to those recommendations are as follows. Um, the pre-application recommendation, uh, a revised, number one was a revised shared parking study shall be submitted as part of an application for discretionary permit and a revised shared parking study has been submitted. Um, number two, explore treatments to Cottonwood Drive that would calm traffic and enhance the pedestrian experience as intended by the, the sawtooth curb. Um, the applicant's response is that tree grates for the street trees along Cottonwood Drive have been added to provide pedestrians the same sidewalk width that the sawtooth curbing provided. Um, and that is shown on the, uh, lands the phase one landscape plan. Um, and secondly, to improve connectivity between phases one and two, a central corridor in the B1 building that connects the phase one parking area and Cottonwood Drive street, streetscape has been added. And that is shown um, on sheet uh, B1-11, first floor plan. Um, recommendation number three, the Williston Historic and, Architect and Architectural Advisory Committee, the HAC, transmittal dated August 6, 2019, shall be adopted as pre-application recommendation recommendations and shall be addressed in design submitted at discretionary permit. Um, the applicant has responded that all comments by the HAC committee have been adopted, including the addition of a glass canopy on the west side of the B1 building to help divide Define the building's main entrance. The HAC also requested that building materials and color samples be presented at the next public hearing. Previous development on this project uh, was reviewed and approved by the DRB as follows. Um, in November of 2015, Cottonwood Crossing received pre application review and authorization by the DRB to proceed to growth management. In March of 2016, Cottonwood Crossing received 173 dwelling unit equivalents of residential growth management allocation. In October of 2016, Cottonwood Crossing received discretionary permit approval for the overall concept of the Cottonwood Crossing pro project with specific approval of a master sign plan for the project and the complete build out of phase one of the project, including buildings A1, B1, and C1. In December of 2016, Cottonwood Crossing Phase 1 receives um, final plan approval and signature from the DRB. Um, phase 1 includes new streets including Cottonwood Drive and parking and buildings A1, B1, and C1 in the project. And finally, um, in April of 2017, uh, the zoning administrator um, issued a uh, administrative permit authorizing construction of phase one of the Cottonwood Crossing project. Um, the proposed use is a mix of residential, commercial, and office uses for the property. The allowed uses in the mixed use residential zoning district are listed in WDB 38A um, and <coughs> WDB 38.13. Further defines the range and scale of permitted uses in the MU RZD as follows. Um, so, new development in the zoning district uh, should be must be predominantly residential, as defined by three criteria. Um, new development must have a minimum density of at least five dwelling units per acre, an average density of 7.5 dwelling units per acre, and may have a density up to 15 acres. Uh, units per acre uh, if there's a transfer of development, uh, a, a transfer of development rights. Um, Non-residential uses should generally be in mixed-use buildings that also include dwellings. Um, buildings that do not include dwellings will be limited to no more than 15 percent lot coverage and at least 10 percent of the proposed dwellings must be included in the first phase of development. Um, and then commercial uses must be comparatively small scale. Um, 
and new office space should be mixed with residential and or permitted commercial uses. Uh, staff has evaluated the proposed phase one development with regard to compliance um, to these requirements and uh, the project, uh, phase one of the project does comply. Um, note that transfer of development rights of 50 dwelling unit equivalents from the project on North Williston Road, known as Keystone Estates and Cottonwood Crossing was approved under DP 0817. And as a result, the minimum density of 15 dwelling unit, uh, the maximum density of 15 dwelling unit units per acre is allowed. Um, no new structures are proposed with this amendment. Uh, for site work, the site is currently under construction with utilities and grading. Um, additional site work to construct the buildings, their parking areas and appurtenances would be undertaken as part of this phase of the project. Uh, there's no boundary line adjustment that's proposed as part of this application. Um, traffic um, per WDB 45.5, traffic impact fees for new vehicle trips will be assessed by the zoning administrator at the time of applications for administrative permits. The DRB did not require any major reworking of the existing traffic study for Cottonwood Crossing as part of this proposed amendment. Um, no changes to vehicular access are proposed. Uh, for pedestrian access, the design of Cottonwood Drive is proposed to be changed. Um, the sawtooth curb pattern previously proposed for the street frontage has been altered to a straight curb section. At pre-application, the DRB recommended the applicant explore treatments to Cottonwood Drive that would calm traffic and enhance the pedestrian experience as intended, as was intended by the sawtooth curb. In response, um, tree grates for the street trees along Cottonwood Drive have been added to provide pedestrians the same sidewalk width that the sawtooth curbing provided. Um, to improve connectivity between phases one and two, a central corridor in the B1 building that connects the phase one parking area and Cottonwood Drive street, streetscape has been added. Um, for parking, uh, parking requirements in Wilson are expressed in WDB 14A as both a minimum and a maximum. This number may then be either increased or reduced through various means allowed in WDB 14 such as the use of transit, shared parking, the use of pervious pavement, and others. The applicant is proposing to add seven parking spaces between the A1 and B1 buildings. At pre-application, the DRB recommended a shared parking analysis be completed and submitted with the discretionary permit application, and a shared parking study has been submitted that shows the proposed uses in phase one require 255 parking spaces um, uh, the table 14A of the Unified Development Bylaw um, states that phase one would require 313 parking spaces had these uses been proposed individually. The applicants proposed a total of 257 parking spaces um, in addition to 28 bicycle parking spaces. Uh, so. The staff has included um, a table that shows the, the um, proposed and required parking facilities. Um, so as I've stated earlier, uh, table, um, per table 14A of the, of the development bylaw, phase one would require 313 parking spaces had these uses been proposed individually and a total of 257 spaces are proposed. Um, the applicant, the DRB may allow for reduction in parking where a shared parking study is submitted by the applicant. The applicant has submitted a shared parking study. It's shown on plan sheet three that shows there is enough difference in the peak hours of proposed uses to reduce the total number of parking of required spaces to 255. This complies with chapter uh, 14 of Williston Development Bylaw. Um, if the DRB approves shared use for a project that uh, spans parcels with different ownerships, the applicant must submit legal documents 
allowing for the shared parking between the properties. Currently, the subject parcels are owned by the developer, so this requirement is not applicable. However, if future ownership changes, a shared parking agreement will be needed, um, and staff has included a draft condition stating this requirement. that we do this but I I sure. imagine most of us have already read this okay so um, basically the number of ADA parking spaces complies um, the number of uh, bicycle spaces um, the overall biking bicycle spaces complies um, the number of long-term bicycle spaces and end of trip spaces uh, complies. However, the end of trip facilities are situated side by side uh, in building A and staff is recommending that long-term bicycle parking spaces and end of trip facilities uh, should be provided in each building um, to be shared amongst all the commercial tenants in that respective building. And as we, I have included a draft condition stating this requirement. Um, no changes in landscaping are proposed. Um, parking lot landscaping uh, has been proposed, uh, which um, complies. Um, street trees, uh, um, the, the tree grates have been added to provide uh, the same sidewalk width uh, that was previously proposed. Um, no outdoor storage is being proposed. Uh, there's <clears throat> no class three wetlands um, that are affected by phase one. There's no changes to outdoor lighting proposed. Um, there are uh, signs um, proposed um, and the applicants provided a master sign plan which will be reviewed separately. There's no changes to stormwater, water and wastewater, utilities, snow storage, solid waste. Uh, there are um, design review elements and um, there's been proposed design modifications to buildings A1 and B1. Um, the applicants proposed to reduce the height of the tower feature uh, in building A1 um, and the elimination of awnings above the storefront windows on the north and west sides of the buildings. Um, the applicant proposes to reduce the footprint of building B1 um, to allow for additional parking and improved circulation. Um, and a design change to the north and east sides of the building to add more storefront windows um, and to improve visibility from Williston Road. Um, the HAC made some recommendations. Uh, they recommend continuing the brick columns through the sign band to connect with a stone element. Um, this, uh, this recommendation was made for building B1 but would apply to A1 and B2 as well. Um, HAC recommends the following condition to ensure compliance with um, that uh, with the hours of operation that there be no loud noise between 10 p.m. Um, to 6 or 7 a.m. The DRB would need to decide. Uh, the HAC recommends um, that final plan shall include wall sconces in the lighting plan. Um, and these recommendations have been redrafted as conditions of approval for the DRB to consider. Um, police, fire, and public works de departments uh, were provided an opportunity to comment. Um, the police and fire did not respond to our request for comments, um, but the applicant's been meeting with the fire department and communicating with regard to meeting their standards. And the Department of Works, Public Works, I had no comments. Um, staff is recommending approval of this per, uh, discretionary permit 
with some recommended findings of fact, conclusions of law, and conditions of, appro of approval as included. Thank you, Melinda. Okay, so the applicant could please walk us through the changes and also um, make note if there's any conditions of approval that you um, object to. Okay. Um, so I would just like to correct um, one of the findings of fact. and. Um, it's number four, and this was an error. Um, it was a discrepancy between what I wrote in the cover letter and what the floor plans for uh, the unit count in the B1 building. So the B1 building will have, um, let's make sure I get this right, um, eight one-bedroom apartments and, um, and 12, I mean, I'm sorry, and 14 two-bedroom apartments. So that is uh, t still 24 units total but in the cover letter, um, I had written uh, 10 one bedrooms and 14 two bedrooms. So that would change finding a fact number four. Um, um, the last sentence where it talks about a reduction in the number of one bedroom dwellings from 15 to 11 should read 15 to nine. And then I would add and increase the number of two bedroom units from 31 to 33. So that was just a minor, but something I wanted to um, to uh, clear up. Brian, does that does that change the totals in the first sentence of that finding of fact? Um, no, because phase one was approved with 15 one bedrooms, so that was the approval from 2016. Gotcha. All right. Um, now we have nine, eight in building B1, and then there's one one bedroom in the C1 building, which, which hasn't changed. Okay. Um, Thank you. And then um, we did want to um, bring up um, two things. Um, one was about the uh, end of trip facility. Um, I believe that was uh, incorporated as a condition of approval number. <coughs> um, twenty-two. Uh, twenty-two. Yep. And so um, when the project phase one has been approved, and we're, we're you know. Um, Post some architectural changes and a, and a small decrease in the footprint of B1, but um, it was approved with two end of trip facilities and both of those were located in the A1 building. Um, I guess a men's and a woman's. Um, and so the requirement is still for two end of trip facilities in phase one and um, staff has uh, mentioned that in the, in the report, um, but then asked that um, the one be provided in the B1 building as well. And so um, I'll just like to um, bring your attention to, uh, to uh, a note that um, in the requirement for the end of trip facilities where, um, you know, there's the requirement for building, but if there's, if there's a, um, an end of trip facility within 600 feet, um, that can be used in lieu of that requirement. So during, in phase one, there are two end of trip facilities required. We have two in the A1 building. The, a1 buildings certainly within 600 feet, so you know we think that requirement's met. So you're asking us not to require that each building have end of trip facilities, and that only one building. Only in one phase building. One. Yep. Are these, <coughs> are these end of trip facilities um, specifically uh, gender specific? Um, well, um, they're, uh, they're both located on the second floor of the um, A1 building, and um, I would assume one's a man's and one's a woman's, but... Uh, Are they... No. No. Okay. There you go. They're not. So they're, they're not. <coughs> they're, they both look alike. Right. Okay. So okay. any gender can go into... Either one. Either one. Okay. So again, just to clarify, right now you're proposing two end-of-trip facilities in one, and does 22 contemplate one in each building or two in each building? I don't, it just says end of trip facility shall be provided in each building. One, so one in each building is two in one, in one building. building. Okay. And it's within 600 feet. The building that doesn't have an, a facility and it in it is within 600 feet of the other building. 
C1, C1 is within 600 feet? Um, B1 is. Uh, and so the end of trip facilities, my understanding of those are there for commercial spaces. Okay. Uh, so, and obviously, you know, we'll ensure that the uh, employees of the B1 building have access to the A1 building. Uh, how, so does that, how does that affect the part about the long-term bicycle parking space? Um, long-term bicycle, we have, uh, we're providing long-term bicycle storage in both buildings. That's, so, okay. so we're fine with that part of uh, condition 22. We just ask that um, that the two required, you know, you, that you you recognize that both of those will be in the A1 building. Obviously, if a tenant in the B1 building wants to add a add a bathroom with a shower, um, you know, they'll they'll be able to do that. But you know, we don't want to commit to that having met the requirement. Okay, understood. What about splitting the two, having two? Unisex, yeah, one unisex in A1, one in B1, instead of two and one. Yeah, um, I mean, we've A1's fully designed, and, and uh, going back to 2016, that's how, you know, that's how, um, you know, we designed it, how, how, uh, how it had been approved. So, um, I see. Yeah. You know, it's just easy, to, uh, easy for us to keep that way, obviously. I think it'll be easier to maintain that way as well. Yeah, one location, so, right? Yeah, right. True. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then, um, this kind of leads right into condition 23, but it was uh, regarding the hacks comment. So we met with, uh, had the hack committee uh, a week ago, and, um, and they had, uh, I'll just actually uh, turn this around and show you, uh, this is the elevation for the B1 building that we've submitted. And, um, and so the hack uh, committee, it was, it, was, it was a positive meeting, but at the, at the end of the meeting, um, one of the members did bring up the comment that you know, he would look, he thought we should um, consider, um, you know, trans being the side in not as continuous, but bringing this, uh, the break, whether through the stone, um, you know, separates these storefront windows, taking this element above, uh, of this stone uh, brick, so that the uh, brick side on the stone. And, um, you know, he asked that we consider that, and we have, and, and I, I've got this elevation that we compared um, after that meeting that shows that. So instead of a continuous sign in, um, it's broken up by, um, you know, brick over stone. Um, to be honest, we showed it to a few people in the office in, in Al, and, and we like um, the original um, better. That's our personal preference. Um, the HAC committee asked that it was something we consider. Um, we obviously have. Um, three of the four board members seemed pretty indifferent on that, but but it was this one gentleman's comment. Um, the way condition 23 is worded um, sounds like you know we have to adopt that. So um, that committee they uh, they kind of acknowledge that um, ultimately it was the board's decision. So we're asking that this elevation be approved, which is the one we submitted with our application. We'll note that we did comply with almost every other request they had. Yeah, we will, everyone. <laughs> we'll maintain the ones that you have on the drawing now. On this, on the, yeah, this is the drawing that we've submitted. Um, and this is one we want to keep. But just to, for comparison purpose, you can see the two side by side. Um, and, and we did bring that brick down on some of the corners. You can see on the corners we did it, but with a, a sign can band. Can you point those out, Al? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, same elevation here. Um, here, here, we have brick breaking up the side. Of it. But these corners, we, we did, you know, some of the focal points, we did extend that brick down. We just thought it was too much when we did it on every single column. Yeah. And then we even tried to extend the stone up to see if that would work better because it's a lighter color. And we still didn't like that. So we, we did try to, to achieve what, what, you know, they were recommended. But we just think that we're, we like the original drawing better. And we checked with some of the people in the office. You know, we, we did that real sophisticated, hey, what do you think? <laughs> Put it to a vote. And, and uh, the original <laughs> one, hands down, so. Yeah, I, I, I kind of think that the, the sign band helps break up the building. It's a three-story building, and, and it's a mixed-use building. The first floor is commercial. The second floor is residential. So, um, you know, there are differences in the floors, and that sign band kind of um, you know, provides a visual break. And there's going to be signs in there as well, right? right. So mm -hmm. that will also bring. We, we hope for that, right? Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> and you know, the other thing that we um, 
you know, we're not sure is, is a tenant, uh, somebody may take multiple storefront windows and in that case they may have um, multiple signs. So to have, you know, that sign band broken, you know, by each window, uh, like on this elevation, you know, we weren't crazy about. What happened to the notches that I saw on the diagram? Uh, you know, when you look down at the building had those, I didn't quite understand, but the building, if you look down at the building, it looked like, it looked like someone had gone through and started cutting uh, out with cookies or something. So that, uh, that no. I think is over the porches. We, we oh, had, one, was? at one point we had these porches right here, um, exposed with, with no roof over them. Oh, you're kidding. But then we, again, Bill, you know, showed us a, a picture with the roofs over it, and it just seemed to be a lot, uh, Vermont, in Vermont, it makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I can say I appreciate you considering the suggestion, and I think you've demonstrated that you certainly did that. Okay. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, we're happy with the approval conditions as they're in, and uh, we've been working with the fire department and public works. Public works had no comment, and uh, um, the fire department's happy with uh, the turning radiuses. Do you have thoughts on the 7 a.m. Um, or the, the quiet time between 10 and 7? Or We recommended the 6 a.m. just because there could be, you know, we're hoping for like three or four restaurants in this whole facility. And we know that food trucks tend to come a little bit earlier. So we asked for a 6 a.m. And they, a couple of them said yes and a couple of them said maybe 7. So they kind of left it up to you guys. But we would request the 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. or 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. no truck traffic. And, and we would schedule the, you know, the, the dump, uh, the dumpsters, and we'll, we'll, we'll do the side closest to the pond first and then head over to the other side if they come early, knowing that there's residential neighbors in the area. Okay. Uh, does the applicant have anything else to add? Yeah, no, I think, I think we're, uh, I think that was about it. I have, I have one comment I want to bring up, um, and it's just related to a lighting detail on the site. So if you were to look at the overall lighting plan for the site, it's very evenly lit. There's no light trespass. It meets you know, all, the ways, um, all of those typical outdoor lighting requirements that we look at. And I apologize if this comment, this may pertain as much to phase two as anything else because it's the lighting along. Cottonwood Way. Um, there's a detail there for a sort of a carriage lamp style fixture. And it raised a question for me as to whether that fixture meets the town's definition of downward facing and fully shielded. Because it looks like the luminaire is in the lower part of the fixture. Um, and that the solid screening on the fixture at the top is, is up above that significantly where there may be potential for some light trespass above the horizontal plane. Frosted glass, correct. We, we, we have frosted glass on that fixture, so you're not going to see a lamp the, directly. The lamp up in the house. The lamp's down here. I, I think that was brought up originally. Um, brought up the hat as well. Was that where that came from originally? Yeah, because that isn't our typical light fixture, so we would... Um, it's a small detail, but one we want to be careful with because uh, they're expensive once they go in. And um, the zoning administrators of, of past eras have been dogged by complaints from Willistonians who live high above Taft Corners who notice suddenly when very bright light is escaping above that horizontal plane. Yeah. So yeah. just just want to call it to everybody's attention to, to be careful. And you know, it, it might be the difference between one catalog number the other and for the DRB to understand um, that particular fixture. I, I noted the same thing, Al, that you did, that it's available with either a clear glass or a frosted glass. So for the DRB to say, if you are above that light and you can see illumination coming through that frosted glass, does that meet your test of bit downward facing fully shielded? Or does that raise concern for the board? I just want to make sure that decision's made clear to everybody here um, before there's a bunch of lights out there. And, and I'm mm -hmm. uh, asked to uh, defend the, the choice of everybody about I think there's a, there's a blackened 
you know, the, the fixture is shaped like this. So on top, it'll be blackened. Yeah. So no, no upward light will come from that. And then on the lower side, which is, and it angles down, that will be the frosted one. Yep. Yeah. Fully frosted. The, Fully the frosted entire, on all four sides. And blackened on the top. So, so in other words, you guys liked your Cree edge and the Rab. The Rab. Well, that's what we like for parking lot lighting. Right. Um, and for and the I lighting. think this Baltimore was pitched by the hack to you guys? Well, we, um, not we by the hack. We presented it to them and you, but it, it was questioned because of, to make sure that it doesn't have that upward light. And it, you know, it, it's not a typical Rab fixture with the downcast shield. Yeah. It's, it's, it's got the frosted <laughs> glass, which will hide the, the, you know, the luminaire, but it'll still be quite bright coming out because it's not completely downcasted. But most street lights, you know, are up much higher. These are more pedestrian friendly street lights. Yeah, you've got a 15 foot. <laughs> yeah. No, I, right. Okay. So the buildings will hide them from the surrounding neighborhoods for the most part. It'll concentrate the light right on the on the street. The are there, the, remind me, are there residential units in the top of uh, of A1 and B1? Just B, B1 and B1. B2 will have the residential. A1 will be all commercial. Okay. So there will be, on either side of the street, there will be residences up high looking down on the, on the street. Yeah, they'll, they'll, the second floor will be approximately maybe just a little bit higher than that height, yeah. And third floor? Third floor will be way above it. Right. Okay. Okay. Anything else, Matt? That's all I've got. Okay. There was, I mean, the, the last, the last um, condition did note that final plan shall include wall sconces in the lighting plan. That's, those are not included right now in the lighting plan? Correct. Those are not included in the lighting plan right now. Yeah. Yeah, right. Those wall sconces will be on the smaller, you know, emergency egress for the apartment buildings on ground level. The, loading, the little loading dock doors that we have in the back. They'll now, be small wattage, they'll have very, very little impact, and they will have the downcast shields. Okay. Those are at the entryways. They're, <clears throat> they're, they show up on the salvation here, uh, left, right, the, door, oh, the entry. Kind of a building thing, they've got to have a, a light at the entrance. At the entrance, that's right. Yeah. The hack committee asked that to help define the, the main entry, and you know they actually provide you know very little light uh, that would can be registered by the lighting plan, but. Um, you know, they certainly yeah. direct you to the intro, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're uh, fine with um, adding those details to the final plan. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, just to clarify on condition 2A, just saying that the final plans have to conform with the HAC uh, memo dated 10-119. To the extent we already discussed the end of trip facilities in each building, is was that in the memo? Um, the HAC committee no, didn't bring up uh, the end of trip facility. Uh, that, that came up uh, as part of the, this DRB review. Um, the issue with the HAC that uh, we had talked about was, uh, was the different, it was the two elevations and they asked that we consider um, breaking up the sign band. Okay. So if we were to not, if we were to agree that not breaking up the sign band is the best course of action, then we would have to modify that as well. Yep, I think you're right. Okay. I think we just strike 23. Well, we strike 23, but then we also have to amend Two. 2A. We're, we're striking that. Is there anything left in the Is hack there anything now? left in the hack? Well, I, to, to be <laughs> honest, um, I thought the hack, I didn't, I can't remember exactly how the hack committal memo was worded, but um, when we left the meeting, it was, uh, you know, our understanding, everyone who was there, was that they phrased it as something to consider, and uh, ultimately it was the DRB's decision. So uh, I don't think it was something that they required, but. Um, yeah. Ours not we, we told them that we would redraw it, take a look at it, and see maybe we would like it, you know, but we just don't. I guess all of the relevant recommendations from the hack are in are 23. Are also conditions. 23, 24, 25, right? Yeah, so we can just strike 2A if we decide to strike 23. Yeah. Or strike two altogether. Right, or just strike two. 
if we agree. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any other questions from the board? I'd like to I'd like to talk about the connection through B one from the parking lot to um, Cottonwood Crossing. Well, I was drive, looking for that drive, word, drive. drive, thank you. Uh, it appears to me that it, it runs through the building right above the, or in line with the garage entrance. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like you to kind of walk us through on the site plan and the elevations of how, how you're going to park behind the building and then get through to Cottonwood Drive and then the, the businesses, I presume, like on the other side of the street or something. Or along the street there. Um, and then, if, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you could turn to uh, the B1 floor plan. It's uh, B1 1.1, but um, looking at both together will help. I just don't have a full size floor plan. It's so most of the way to the back. So if, uh, if, you, if you first take a look at the B1 floor plan, you'll, you'll see the corridor in the center of the building, but then on the, um, I guess it's the east side of the building, um, that corridor is almost L-shaped. Um, so the entrance to the corridor is actually right about here. So you, you from the parking lot, you enter the building, uh, go left down the corridor, and then straight through. So and that, the reason why is because if it just went straight through the middle of the building, that wouldn't work because of the it would be over the parts correct entrance. So um, from Cottonwood Drive, it's, it's it's in the center of the building, but um, from the parking lot, it's a little offset. And so that central corridor makes it easy if you park in the parking lot and you know you want to uh, go to a store that's the main entrance is on the street, or if you even want to go to the B2 building or A2 building in phase two. Um, the B2 building has the same central corridor, so really, you know, we did that just to really connect all parking areas and buildings. So you can go through B2, yeah, and I, yeah. I know it's a preview to the next hearing, but... Yeah. <laughs> you know, I guess the, the, the comment I would make as I look at this is that if, as a, someone unfamiliar with a building or a facility, if, I, if I'm intending to walk through, it would be a lot handier if when I walked in, I could kind of see straight through to that exit on the other side where I can see the daylight, I can see the activity, instead of relying, in reality here, probably on a sign and then another sign to tell me to turn up this way. It, 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 did you look at the options for, for either going straight in from that door that you're entering or the, the, the door that's on the diagonal that gets you right out to the, the central hub there of, uh, of Cottonwood Crossing? The, the crossing. Yeah, actually, I think we did, um, Bill. Um, I can speak to that. Right? Yeah. Because we uh, we did look at precisely that. Why don't you flip that around? Because it'll show up good on the elevation. What we wanted to do on the uh, on the Cottonwood Crossing side, um, this is obviously where the, the corridor comes through on the, uh, on the Cottonwood Drive Front side. Yes, side. Yeah, so where, where we have the glass entry. If we had moved the corridor over one bay to be in line with the corridor through to the back side. It was in an awkward spot in the building to not make it line and if we moved it down further to this one, but this pediment over here was getting, we felt too far to this end of the building. It was, it was a judgment call. We also, our, our elevator is up um, towards this side of the building, as you can see in the floor pan of 1.1. So we, we wanted that, that corridor, cross corridor, to connect with the elevator and with the parking lot. And there is that one. was the best solution to that. We try to make all those disparate things work together and with the elevation of the building to try to keep it under this uh, prominent central feature. So that was, uh, that, that's what we came up with. Yep, big, that was perfect, Bill. Um, so yeah, that was something we, we kind of thought about in, um, they, you know, the only other thing I'll add to that is that uh, from the back side of the building of this elevation, um, there's not a, there's an entrance on either side of the of the garage ramps. So, and both of them connect to that main corridor. And are those are those a those a grade? I mean, I'm, yes. 
Okay. There. So we, we put a door on either side of the parking garage ramp down. That door will service a retailer on that side and allow us to enter into the hallway where the elevator is or from the other side of the parking garage ramp so that if somebody parked, say, closer to building C, they wouldn't have to walk around the ramp and go to the right to come back. They could cut right down. There'll be a little bit of a sidewalk to the left of the ramp as you're going down as well which will lead to a door into that hallway. So, yeah, so you can enter the building here or mm -hmm. enter it over here. It doesn't, mm -hmm. Into the common the, space of the, the building. The ramp was kind of in the way to, uh, difficult to work them all out. Uh, you know, I was so the, there'll, be, there'll be daylight, John, from, from the front looking back. You'll be able to see the front, the back doors light. You won't be able to see the door directly, but there'll be light coming from them if it's during the day. So the, the, the main tenant space there in the, in the knuckle, on the, the diagonal piece, those doors, they're kind of right there next to the ramp. Those are going to go directly into that tenant space. That's correct. So Well, into a common area. And then into the tenant space. Um, no, that's not. Yeah, I would strong is. Uh, it's showing here. Yeah, it actually. Um, you know, that would be a pretty simple um, change to make to to just um, add a add that short hallway stub that would connect. It. But but yeah, you're correct. Right I now. I yeah. Be, I thought it went to both areas. So um, you know, that's something we can certainly add to the final plans. We would certainly make the previous argument you made. Make, yeah. Make more sense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, there sh probably should be um, a connection uh, from both sides of the back garage ramp. To the common area. Yep. Because yeah. otherwise that story is closed, you can't get through there. True. And then you're turning rock and roll all the way back around the ramp. Yeah. And then you're not happy. You're right. <laughs> not at all. I assumed you looked at me, you've got kind of a maximum slope on your ramp. Yeah. You couldn't pull that back so you could have the entrance right above the ramp. Um, that ramp was, it was a really kind of a... Uh, uh, tough, uh, tough place to fit because uh, we we're obviously trying to um, meet our parking requirement, and moving the ramp to the to the right um, means, yeah, I mean, shifting all those parking spaces with it, and uh, so we looked at putting a walkway over the over. Yeah, the, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's how it was originally approved. Yeah. Then we, it, we it thought that car, right, right as you're going down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not your car, yeah. but your SUV. Yeah, <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, so are you guys gonna have a? Uh, a nice big drain under your uh, washing machines in the laundry room that's right right next to the guy's yes, bedroom. Well, so we've learned our lesson. Okay. <laughs> and then the other one was is what kind of insulation are you gonna have for the other bedroom that's flush up against the elevator? Um, we we take pretty good care of insulating all the tenant demising petitions because we've had that issue as well that there, there are complaints when, when you oh, don't yeah. insulate and soundproof well. Oh yeah, yeah yep. just, I'm just curious yep. because I mean, I've heard, I've heard those elevators running. It's like, oh, yeah. you can hear them and you're not in that room. Right. You can hear them in that hallway. Well, that guy's gonna basically be in the bedroom with his bed right up against it. Yes. Yeah, okay. Bill just mentioned that, you know, the elevator shaft itself is actually made of masonry block, which. Yeah. Is it? Uh, yeah. yeah, it will be. So that, that, that does help some. But I, I, I know what you're talking about. You can okay. still hear that motor cranking up and, yeah. Okay. Okay, what other questions? Can you show us the additional spaces in the block where you're changing the parking lot? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and there will, no, will be no lighting that will be impacted by the changing of the parking? Lighting? Um, no, there will. So, so the, the th spaces that were added were are these seven. Um, originally, the B1 building actually, you know, according to where those seven spaces are, and um, we kind of made a decision that, uh, that those seven spaces were worth a reduction of the size of the building. So, those are the, the new spaces. And uh, I think originally the light was. Um, Right here at the edge of the drive, and these spaces didn't exist, and so we just moved that that light back. Hey, yes, I'm not good. Okay, I'm just waiting my turn to fire away. The uh, the parking spaces and the sawtooth. 
uh, the elimination of the sawtooth and the grates. I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying in the narrative because which part of the sidewalk hasn't changed or what is there is the the open kind of uh, width of the of the walkway itself is not changed or it is narrower or is it wider? Depending on where you're measuring from. Well, exactly. The right. saw or the tooth. <laughs> exactly. So I'm just trying to make sure I understand. I mean, before from the, the narrow part of the sidewalk, then it, it then it got wider, right? Because it jutted right, out from the, the parking spot. And the trees are in that in that triangle that's been I don't know if the trees are in the triangle. They were they were in the sidewalk uh -huh. and they started at the, the the closest point to the you know, where the right. straight curve is now. Mm -hmm. So the trees will be in the same part of the sidewalk. People will have to walk around them, but the grates will allow them to walk over yeah. that portion of the sidewalk. So, so the trees are essentially in the same spot. The yes. building's in the same spot. Yes. And the, the there would, there'll be a little less landscaping space in that sawtooth. More, more, more parking paving. That's correct. Um, and less sidewalk treatment. Yes. Correct. Like, uh, if you, page seven of the staff report is, uh, I guess, the best way to, uh, you know, to visualize that because it shows a side by side of the of what was uh, approved in, in uh, the the current design. <laughs> So on the on the left was the was the approved design, and and then you can see those bump out islands where. Um, where we had landscaping, they're not shown in that picture, but that's where the street trees were. And then uh, on the right, where um, essentially, you know, showing tree grates in more sidewalk. Um, those uh, those bump outs are are have been eliminated that the sawtooth created. So the width of the sidewalk is essentially the same. The it's actually the size of the landscape portion is smaller because we're taking part of the sawtooth out and, and the tree grade's gonna just... Yeah, so to provide the same pedestrian experience, it, it really doesn't do much for a traffic calming, but I don't think that the sawtooth was intended to provide traffic calming. It was, the sawtooth curbing was just something kind of interesting, um, you know, we thought would be, you know, different to do in this project, but um, we really got some negative feedback on that. <laughs> And you're going to have greater than seven feet at those tree grades between the building. Um, so you'll have greater than seven feet in between there. Did Pocket Park increase in size and you eliminated uh, I think it did. I think, it, I think it, ever so slightly. Um, I think it got, it got just a little bit bigger. Um, definitely not smaller. It looks like you're just on the side by side. What's to the left of what was originally proposed? So, looks like. Well, there was also a buyer retention area in there that wouldn't really yeah. be utilized um, by anybody within the pocket park. Um, so, with the removal of that buyer retention area, um, the usable space within that pocket park did increase. Bio retention. It's like a stormwater feature. Okay. Yeah. So right. We put it in the Okay, so pond. that's all right. I see that. Yeah. That's. But what's to the left of Pocket Park? Uh, to uh, in the original in the, the original. Design? Um, and that's uh, that's an, a, an island with a dumpster. Oh. Like, okay. uh, yeah. Small small islands. So the two the two those are two dumpsters. Mm -hmm. Yep. Correct. And yep. those are. Or where um, they, we've, uh, we've moved them so um, originally they were in that uh, landscape by the land in this general area. So um, we've, uh, we've proposed uh, three, uh, three dumpsters for, for all the phase one buildings. The trash guys like to go straight at it, they don't like to have to do this little yeah, yeah. loop de loop. So we did some homework and it gets them further away from the buildings. Also gets them away from the parking spaces that were by those parks. Yeah. Yep. And, and from the buildings. Right. Makes for a nicer pocket park than to have the dumpster not right next to it. Dumpster, dumpster trucks do not like to have vehicles parked next to where they're flipping stuff out. No. And as part of phase one, you're going to be doing the square. Correct. Two. What's going to go in there? 
Um, nothing really. It's uh, just a landscape square, right? Um, you know, uh, we've, we've got parking proposed around it, but um, you know, we didn't think it would be a great space to, you know, provide a place for people to really, you know, sit. It's right in the middle of of a lot of traffic. So, you know, we just kind of thought it would make a nice landscaped island. What's the size of it? Um, well, um, it's got a, it's gonna be a curb square, but um, a portion of that's gonna be, actually have to be mountable curb um, for like a, for a fire truck to be able to swing around. Right, um, do you know the d dimensions of that, Dan? It'd be it'd be a little more than 60, 60 feet. Foot, 60, 70 foot, something like that. I right. That, Co that includes the, the raised curb. So the, the cotton would drive right away 66 feet, and uh, that square is wider than that. So I, I would say, yeah, 70, 80 feet across. But the actual landscape is only going to be in the center, so that'll mm -hmm. only be about 30 or 40 feet, right? Right. Yeah. Yep, that's what I'd say, I would say 40 feet. Mm-hmm. I think the circle in, in Maple Tree Place, the roundabout, is going to be easy to drive through. Okay. It's from a scaling perspective. Yep. Yeah. Similar. I do see, I, I saw in your, this traffic signing plan, you've got one-way one way signs on that circle, and I, I guess I would encourage you to put those signs in. Uh, you know, I know it, um, it would be nice. It'll feel like it's disrupting that landscape, but I, I could definitely see people being a little confused coming sure. up to this for the first time, and yeah. if the paint markings fade away, you know, they'd be apt to turn left when they're not supposed to, so I think it's really important to have those one-way signs there. Sure. Oh, yeah, they'll definitely be in there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with the signs, they're still coming in. They do not enter at the post office. Oh, sure, people are. Yeah. That's all. At least you won't be liable if they if they if crash and die, right? Yeah. You guys want to move your seats around so you look like a different group? Yeah. <laughs> we have to go change. <laughs> oh, you just do the test like this. Pick two fingers. Which two? Okay. <laughs>
Yes, so we wait. Just a, a question on the the, the overall market. Is, is so you bumping up the two two bedroom down the one bedroom? I, my understanding was that the one bedrooms are, are what's selling and can't build them fast enough. But you have a sense that there's more demand for two bedrooms. Is that? We don't have you know a real sense. It's just we. Your crystal ball is telling you that, yeah. Yeah. And are you planning on selling, or are you just leasing them? Sell, right? <laughs> right price, right. Uh, we just did a 24 unit building in Essex and uh, had uh, three one three bedrooms, one and those, you know, went out within a day. Yeah. Um, so, but, but we tried to but keep so the split. Two bedrooms, right. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's completely full. We had, we had, actually, we had uh, three one bedrooms and 45 two bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. And they were all rented before we built them. We couldn't build them fast enough wow. when people were renting them. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. But yeah. It's there. Yeah. Yeah, that's not uncommon what we're hearing. Yeah. Yeah. But yet we're losing population. Like the, the math doesn't seem to work. <laughs> no. Yeah. 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 Uh, just one new member, David, if you would please introduce yourself uh, and give your address, please. My name is uh, David Epstein. I'm with Trucks Collins Architect. And our, my address is 209 Battery Street, Burlington, Vermont. Great, thank you. Uh, staff goes first. Okay, so this is a request for discretionary permit review for Cottonwood Phase 2. Um, phase two includes the development of the northwest portion of the site with buildings A2 and B2. Building A2 is going to house the community bank serving, um, and then B2 will be a three-story three mixed-use building with residential uses on the second and third floors. Underground parking is proposed under Building B2. Um, <clears throat> the applicant's also proposing a five lot subdivision uh, in order to facilitate the acceptance of Cottonwood Drive, Connor Way, and Fisher Walnut Street as public roads. Um, and uh, the DRB previously reviewed this project on August 13, 2009 as a pre-application and made several recommendations. I will not read these recommendations, nor the applicant's response. Um, and I'm not going to go over the project history. Um, so <clears throat> the applicant proposes a retail bank and headquarters with drive-through service in Building A2 retail, commercial, and residential uses in building B2. These are allowed uses. Um, for structures, uh, applicants propose constructing building A2 and B2. Um, and B2 buildings can be similar to the B1 building. Um, the site work, the site is currently under construction. Um, the applicant's proposing a five lot subdivision and that will divide the site into four quadrants. Um, traffic impact fees will be assessed, uh, at the time of administrative permit. Um, the traffic, um, Reworking the traffic study wasn't required. Uh, no changes to vehicular access are proposed. Um, we've already talked about the pedestrian connection um, between phase two parking area and Wilston Road. Um, and then the um, multi-use path has been added along Wilston Road. Um, 
and there will be uh, a parklet between the A2 and B2 buildings for pedestrians. <coughs> um, and then the parking, they submitted a shared parking study which indicates 230 parking spaces will be required. They have proposed 232 parking spaces. Um, I've included the ta a table that shows proposed and requir required parking facilities. Um, basically complies, uh, except there, uh, the site generates a requirement for, en for 10 ADA spaces uh, where seven are currently proposed, um, three additional handicapped accessible parking sp spaces should be provided and shown on the site plan. Um, and also, uh, because the parcels will be under different ownerships, a um, shared parking agreement will be required. Um, there's a the site generates a requirement for 24 bicycle spaces, 25 spaces are proposed, uh, 11 short-term bicycle spaces are required, uh, and um, it looks like, uh, let's see, looks like, uh, 17 are proposed. Um, and then um, the site generates a requirement for long term bicycle parking and into trip facilities. Um, 13 spaces are required, where 14 spaces are proposed. And again, staff is recommending um, that. Uh, an end of trip facility per be provided in each of the buildings um, and that long-term bicycle parking spaces be provided in each of the buildings um, to be shared amongst all the commercial tenants in that respective building. Um, a landscaping plan has been provided and, um, and the proposed developments internal to the overall Cottonwood Crossing project uh, which is proposed to be buffered from adjacent parcels. Um, let's see. So the, the parking lot behind building B2 initially was shown with 31 spaces in a row, has been reconfigured to comply with WDB 23.5, which um, states that if you have more than 24 spaces in a row, it shall be broken up by landscaped islands. Um, let's see. There's no outdoor storage proposed. Um, there are some class three wetlands on the parcel. Um, they were reviewed, or they were uh, reviewed and discussed uh, in the overall Cottonwood Crossing approval. Um, and at that time, the Conservation Commission had no concerns about wetland impacts. Um, outdoor lighting has been proposed um, and the plan, the proposed lighting plan appears to comply um, except for that one uh, question about the, the, um, the type of lights that were being proposed and whether they were in fact going to be down shooting lights. Um, And then um, there's, uh, the, let's see, the applicants provided a master sign plan, which will be reviewed separately. Um, solid waste receptacles are shown on plan sheet 10. Um, three dumpsters are shown. Um, trash receptacles are subject to design review. Um, and there were no specifications submitted that showed um, pedestrian grade trash receptacles. Um, those should be provided. Um, 
and the hack reviewed this project which is subject to design review uh, and again um, similar recommendations to phase uh, one amendment so um, recommending the hack recommended continuing the brick columns through the sign band uh, and I made a similar recommendation about the hours of operation and um, the a similar recommendation about the wall sconces um, police and fire departments did not respond to requests for comments the public works department submitted um, some comments which have been included here and staff is recommending approval of this discretionary permit um, with some proposed uh, findings of fact and conclusions of law and conditions of Right. Thank you, Melinda. Okay, so walk us through, please, the, uh, the changes, and uh, and you don't have to do it in this order, and uh, and then uh, speak to the conditions of approval. And I already noted number number twenty three. I'm assuming that you have the same. Um, the same concern about that that you cited in phase one is that true? Yep, that's okay. true. So that was okay. So you don't you don't need to address that one. Okay. Okay. So um, I think I'll Mike. If you want to speak to the landscape plan, um, I know at the pre-application plan, one of the um, issues that came up was the uh, within the issue that we're subdividing a lot for the bank that we didn't want that to feel like it was separate project. So. Um, Mike has kind of um, designed a, the connection to that. We're pretty happy with it. <laughs> Let him talk about that. The, uh, the idea is you've got the street and you've got a really um, a whole new entrance really on both sides. Um, so um, I know one of the comments was the connection out to the rec path, so we extended that, that walkway. Um, the bank itself um, has the through entrances on either side, and this one um, has kind of an arcing walkway that orients people out to this sort of the center of gravity of, of the parking, if you will. I mean, there's, there's other tabs that go out and access some other, uh, other areas of parking, so it's efficient for people to get in and out. Um, but it sets up a direction towards this, in this direction. Um, and what we did was extended the landscaping uh, on the, I guess it would be the south side of this, this access drive in um, to really be the major um, breaking of the parking. And that is about, I think it's about a 20 foot wide strip. It's got a walk on either side with uh, trees and grass down the middle. Um, and we're proposing some benches in that area. So um, that's the main connecting piece landscape wise. It's sort of a destination, not exactly a destination, but it's at least a rather robust piece of landscaping out in the middle of the, uh, of the parking. And from there, uh, a couple of jogs brings you to the, the main entrance to the uh, B2 building, uh, which again has a fairly uh, significant green space out in front of it. So, so we're, we're saying that that's a pedestrian friendly zone along the, along the faces of the buildings. Since pre-application, the architecture hasn't hasn't changed too much. We've developed plans a little a little bit, but a pre-application we had full elevations uh, that we, we presented. Mm -hmm. um, so if we we're going to jump into the conditions of approval, um, same conditions as phase one um, regarding the hack comments, um, because those apply to um, three of the four buildings. I think we addressed that. Um, and then um, same comments we have regarding end of trip facilities. So uh, Community Bank has provided one for their building. Um, 
but uh, we have not provided one for the B2 building. So there's, there's two endotrip facilities in the A1 building, and those will be made available for three of the four buildings. Those will be A1, B1, and B2. So all within 600 feet, um, we feel that requirement's met. Can you repeat that? You said you have um, so the one common, in the community bank. Right. There's, um, there's one in community bank, and then there are two in the A1 building that we just presented in phase one. Um, none in uh, B1 and no uh, in B2, but um, the requirement allows for an entrance trip facility within 600 feet of a building to be used in place of uh, one in each building. You're proposing the one in A1 is gonna meet the requirements for phase two as well. Yes, we're proposing just, there's just building B2, not because the, the bank will have their own. The bank, yeah, the, 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 the staff's comment was um, that each building needed an end of trip facility. Um, the bank's provided one in the A2 building, and we provided two in the A1 building. So the two in the A1, A1 building we're asking uh, be uh, considered for A1, B1, and B2. What is the projected employee numbers for buildings A1, B1, and B2? Because the bank's out of the game. Right. So what are we looking at for projected employee numbers that could potentially be using this as a facility? Well, uh, it's uh, 50,000. Those, those three buildings are about 50,000 square feet of commercial space. So, you know, one employee per 1,000. Um, it really depends on the use that goes in there, but um, maybe 50 employees, um, two showers. I just I just trying to get a get a ballpark because you were saying you were looking for restaurants. And restaurants tend to have a higher employee density than you know retail space. Right, and uh, just just trying to get a focus. Right, there was an office though, less than office. Really? So. Well, sometimes you know we have tenants in other buildings who um, who will put in a shower for their employees. Um, but as far as the town's requirement for an end of trip facility, um, if the requirements too for this size project, we provided um, two in the A1 building, and then Community Bank providing one in their building. Oh, so you're so you're you're saying that there is a possibility that future tenants may elect to do something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, they, that's what they want to do. Okay. Melinda, can you clarify the, how we come up with the requirement for the number of end of trip facilities? Is it based on the number of uh, long term bicycle spaces? Mm -hmm. So it's one per. Or how does that work? It's. Uh, the chapter. And I would guess that the, that long-term bicycle spaces be calculated only on the commercial, because obviously you know the residential. Right. Yeah. Right. right. So they would right. theoretically have their own. So shop. for yeah. um, require okay. So if you have four to eighteen required long-term bike parking spaces, you are required to have one per gender of end of trip facilities. So essentially two for up to 18. So we're essentially, what's being proposed, I understand, is you're combining the, the total number of long-term spaces in all three of those buildings. Correct. So what does that come to? I, don't, I haven't seen that math here. So it's, we're saying you've got 13 for phase two. But how many of those are um, covered by in the bank? Well, it's, so the number is actually going to be quite low. Um, looking at that table on page five, um, the residential units are are included in that long-term bicycle calculation. So, if for phase two, um, just looking at just the long-term space, bicycle spaces required in phase two, um, it's thirteen. But eight of those are from the residential, and um, 0.4 are from the bank. So. So the number for the B2 building is actually, you know, going to be... Oh, I see. That, so it's all these others. The two, three, six, four... Yeah, five, I think. Almost five. Not quite five. five. So five. Yep. And then phase one... Um, I believe it's... It's 
a little bit more, but but the total we're still under 18. Phase of the items titles. So phase, so phase one is the total 16, but it includes 10 of those 16 are for the residential units. So that number is really five. six. So, so five is 11. Yeah, 11. And so we're under the, you know, so two, two um, long-term end of trip facilities are required. You know, we have two in the A1 building. And, and I recognize this may sound like it's splitting hairs and it's probably aimed as much over here. Does, it, does the rule really say that it's one for each gender? It really says that. Great. It's on the bylaw list cleanups. Yes, it does. Okay. Because otherwise, then the, the, the bank would be required to have two. Not otherwise. It, it sounds like they are required. They are, are required, required to have two. And if it's right, unless we decide that it's a cleanup. Yeah, we, have, we do challenge. Anyway, that's unfortunate. You're proposing one at the bank, is that right? Um, I believe there's, I need to see the floor plan. Do we have the yeah, floor plan? Yeah, uh, staff report said one, but. Uh, I think there's more than one. What right before, it's probably on the first floor? Or? Um, retail and office. Oh, oh, you mean that's Correct, one. I'm sure you guys get questions all the time on these intertrips. <laughs> Just trying to understand. Yeah. But it's gender first. It's gender new. Health room. Is it health room? Is that what? Is is that, no, it's a, it's a shower room, um, and it's right between. Uh, two, oh yeah, yeah. Two restrooms, yeah. and it's uh, the tent was just gender new. What is the health room? So that? What is the health room? Health room is a required space, um, essentially for nursing moms. Oh, okay. And other things, you need a nap rest, you don't feel well, but it's primarily for nursing moms. Or uh, if you have a pump and things like that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's actually now required. And it's, a, it's a very common feature in offices now. It's a very common feature in most offices yeah. now. And health room is kind of the, go, the, the standard term. Uh, we all call it something yeah. different. Yeah, but. okay. So, so Public Works did have a couple real minor comments. Uh, if you want, we can go through those, or um, we've addressed them um, directly. But it's up to, up to you guys if you want us to. Let's, uh, let's go through those. Okay. Yep. So um, we did reply to Public Works with some um, updated plans yesterday. Uh, Public Works had a comment, provide easement for the multi-use path over lot 82. Well, on the property plat, um, we are providing a 16-foot easement over the multi-use path um, on lot 82. So that uh, comment has been met. Um, all landscaping shall be on our approved list. Um, and talking with Mike Lawrence, um, we will be meeting that requirement as well. Um, provide detailed information on grease oil separator. So um, within the restaurant for building B2, we are proposing a grease oil separator inside the building. Um, it will have uh, 100 gallons of storage for grease and it will be able to accept a flow of 50 gallons per minute. Um, which is more than sufficient for the 100 seat restaurant um, based on a peak flow from the restaurant of 25 gallons per minute. So uh, we are uh, meeting that requirement as well and provided Public Works with some um, specifications and detail on that uh, grease oil separator. Uh, number four, provide documentation for the four way stop at Cottonwood and Phase one and two, uh, round square bouts do not require stop signs, provide supporting documentation showing it is necessary. Uh, so we reached out to Roger Dickinson, um, had him comment as he's our traffic expert, and he uh, thought that the stop, shine, stop signs should, be, um, should remain as originally approved as uh, he did not envision this as a roundabout or square about. Um, that is an intersection and typically you don't want parking in intersections. Um, so he envisioned it as a one-way drive aisle. 
Um, so he thought that the stop signs um, as you enter that one-way drive aisle uh, were necessary. Um, and then the speed limit signs are not shown. Uh, Roger did provide two speed limit sign locations, um, one in front of building A2 as you come in um, down Cottonwood Drive from Route 2, and then another one on uh, Connor Way um, up at the, pretty close to the property line with uh, Maple Tree Housing. Um, so as you're coming in from Maple Tree Place, um, there would be a 25 mile speed limit sign over there as well. And he, um, he thought 25 miles per hour uh, was acceptable as uh, these, streets, these streets could potentially become public roads. And uh, Roger stated that the minimum um, speed limit for public road uh, was 25 miles per hour. Um, and then comment number six, um, it looks like it's a repeat of comment number three about the grease oil separator. Um, so we did provide that information, Public Works, and uh, we also provided Public Works with an updated sewer allocation application um, as it was revised a little bit from the pre-application once we nailed down the number of one and two bedroom units and square footages. So we provided that to Public Works as well. Right. Any other items on the conditions of approval that you'd like to know? Two A, which is that comment? Addressed. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Twenty-three, uh, which is uh, the again. Yep. Uh, hours of operation 24. Um, we're asking for 6 a.m., which is a little less restrictive. Yep. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, back a few to 21 um, about the end of trip facilities um, receiving credit for the two that are in the A1 building. Um, the B2 building will have long term bicycle storage. Got it. Uh, board members, questions? I'd like to just understand a little bit more about the subdivision. I feel like that, feel, I feel like it's a little bit missing even from. So, um, last page, is that right, Dan? Yeah, it's sheet PL. Um, yeah, last page of the plan set. Um, is a, is a proposed par property plat. And, um, this was actually something that um, wasn't required when the project was approved um, in 2016, but came up um, before we started construction as an issue with uh, uh, Bruce Hoare, the director of public works. Um, and he had asked that um, the roads within Cottonwood, Cottonwood Drive and Connor Way, and even Walnut Street, which is gonna be in one of the later phases, be offered to the town as um, public potential public roads. Uh, doesn't mean that he's going to accept take those over, but wanted those roads offered to the town. So um, those roads subdivided the, the property into four quadrants. Um, the fifth lot um, came about as as the result of Community Bank wanting to own their own lot. So um, on, the, on the right side of the road, as you enter in from Williston Road. Um, that area in phase two is is two lots. So total um, is a five lot subdivision. So the the property line between the A two building for Community Bank and the B two <coughs> building um, will be kind of right along this divide of parking spaces. But you know, really won't be noticeable if you're you're visiting the site. But it appears, that, so right now, as proposed, the buildings that are on B2 and A2 are not both in lot two, lot one. Nope, nope. so, so um, lot one consists of the three phase one buildings. 
Um, and then lot two has only the A2 building. Um, that will be um, okay. owned by Community Bank. And then lot three will have the B2 building. Okay, so the Community Bank will be on lot two. Correct. Lot three is, okay. Sorry, I was misoriented when I was looking at that. It was B2. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this was originally approved as a four lot subdivision and now you're adding uh, no actually it was originally approved uh, without a subdivision it was all approved um, on um, a 12 buildings on the master plan on a on a one acre lot so um, I, I'm, I'm sorry a one lo one 17 acre lot um, so now we've um, you know with the road issue that's kind of created four lots we've just added a fifth lot and uh, this application um, kind of cleans cleans it all up because it, this was the the road was something that uh, Bruce had asked for after the project was uh, was had been approved but you know we were happy to offer him the roads because that may you know maybe someday you know those roads will become town roads and that would be good for for us. <laughs> So A2 then meets, I mean, I don't see where the proposed building is going to be, but that would meet all setbacks and everything. That, is there any plan that shows the um, proposed construction? I believe so. So um, sheet 3A, um, sheet 3A is uh, the site plan, um, yeah. and that shows the buildings and property lines. So we would be meeting the 50-foot setback from Williston Road, um, and staff does note in the staff report um, that although this is a subdivision, um, that it makes sense to evaluate individual phases as they are developed. The five parcels can still be viewed as a single planned unit development when considering the overall compliance of the project. Uh, to the standards of the WDB uh, 38 and other bylaw standards, uh, such as landscaping, buffering, and setbacks. So I think uh, the takeaway from that there was they would still be looking at the overall development as a PUD um, for setbacks. They wouldn't be looking at the setbacks um, internally for each individual lot as it's a PUD. Yeah, so for the example, only, the, only, the only line that would be affected if it is yeah so for example like um, a lot of times with you'll have a landscape buffer requirement between you know you and your neighbor um, it doesn't make sense to do a landscape buffer between a2 and b2 so I think that's staff's comment that there we're reviewing Cottonwood Crossing as as a project of an overall project in, in compliance with the zoning but that this creation of lots um, allows for the board some flexibility are there any findings of facts related to that in the subdivision itself, pertaining to the subdivision and pertaining to how the town is treating it as a single PUD? Not in the findings of fact. So, so in other words, staff so report, but yeah. I did not include a finding of that. Right? If there became, if A2 and B2 suddenly became nasty neighbors, B2 would find itself in trouble because it's sitting right on, almost sitting on the lot line, with no, no, with no setback, no, uh, there's no room for uh, any kind of vegetation or anything at that point this, right, is, right. Where, this is where the lot this is where the, I see that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I mean it's I, does it meet does B2 meet setbacks I well guess. um you know uh, the town uh, the town staff's opinion that those internal lot lines um, you know, historically that's how uh, the town has treated um, similar um, developments that may include separate lots but they're all considered as one as in, for the sake you know for the purposes of uh landscaping they're all considered as one development yeah. so so then what about um setbacks and other dimensional requirements same uh same thing so, there, so that'll be that'll be in the document when this is all done that that's that all this stuff has been approved 
as a variant? Uh, I mean, I guess we could add a finding of fact that states that. Well, I'm just saying is that for any reason that there was, I wouldn't want to see the owners of B2 down the road suddenly be faced with, okay, we've got to dig up our uh, parking lot that's right next to our property because we've got to put plants there. So I mean, I think I'm we just saying there should, be some kind, there should be some kind of town document put into that that says, the, you know, this has been approved. Right. And, uh, you know, just add that. That's being created. Like the final yeah. plans become that document. So in the okay. future, if there's a neighbor dispute, tough luck, you're under a shared parking agreement, you share this driveway access, um, and all those internal property lines um, for the purposes of setbacks and landscaping don't generate that requirement because they're um, more clerical and in nature and establishing ownerships and not looking at the development potential um, because it's that planned unit, one approval, looking at the site wide. Um, yeah. This is a It's, it should have been handled on the previous one. I didn't catch the comment. Just to make sure, the Connor extension on the original, on the previous plan, we're going all the way, right? Um, to the pump station. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. right, all the way to the eastern property line. Yeah. Um, yeah. By okay. a retention pond. So yeah. that, that, like I said, because all, all I heard him mention was the circle, and I suddenly realized, well, there's a piece yeah. we didn't talk about. Right, yep, the easternmost piece. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually... Uh, it's, uh, it's 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 half built now. It's, okay. it's included, isn't it included in the phase one? Yeah, it's included in phase one. Right. What I'm trying to say is I did not ask that question and forgot it okay. until this moment. That's it. I'm done. Is it is it potentially feasible that that road could connect? Is it in this a different zoning district just right, beyond? To the next property? Yeah. Yes, to the it's east. Designed for that. And it is the same zoning property. Oh, it is. Right now. Oh, okay. Okay. I think you know the property owners who are <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mike. Well, I mean, we're going to see you guys again. So, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. We've got a few, few uh, months worth of work ahead of us right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> no? No? No, um, just a real quick, uh, and I think I'm on the the thought process of changing designs were the buildings that were approved in phase two have those been redesigned in any way uh, well so uh, we had a, the master plan approved but we never really submitted any um, elevations for phase two um, but it was always kind of the, the original plan was to have at least the b2 building be similar to the b1 building so um, so we really only submitted footprints but the footprint actually did of uh, well, the elevations that are Right, so those are new elevations. Yeah, those are new elevations. But I guess the one change um, that has occurred is originally phase two consisted of three buildings, and um, now it's two buildings, and the B2 building's a little bit larger. Um, the A2 building's very similar to what, um, you know, the original approval is, it just has a drive through now. <laughs> he disappeared because we've made the, made the entrances to the parking lot better. Yep, mm -hmm. that's why. This, I mean, this is pretty much the same as was presented at Fiat. Yes, yeah. it is. The only on the bank, um, the hack committee asked us to add some windows above the drive-through, and we did. And um, I think that's the only change, really, from what you saw at Fiat. I wasn't on the board then, so I didn't uh, see anything. Pri but prior to that, as David has referred to this new building, instead of being brothers and sisters, it's now cousins. It's a little different than what it used to be, but very similar. The wings make it interesting. Yeah. And from a site perspective, the sidewalk has been in front of a, 
on the western side of A2 has been extended to the path along Route 2, and there's also a crosswalk um, connecting over to Building B2, um, which was feedback we received from the board at pre-application. So, is there is there a connection to the sidewalk or the drive that goes up on the, the property north here uh, to Maple Tree Place? No, from the from the main landscaping path that goes between A the, the two and B two. Uh, yeah, here, yeah, right through there. Yeah. No, um, um, there's not. It, uh, is that a sidewalk up there, or there is that a driveway? Of a, of a sidewalk that was built um, as part of the Maple Tree Place project. 20 years ago, uh -huh. but uh, that it doesn't connect to our property. That was done because the bike path never got completed on Route 2, but now we will be completing that bike path on Route 2, right. so that connection will be there. Yeah, so uh, going back to 2016, we uh, were given two options. There was a multi-use path along Route 2, and um, we connected this section. This was kind of considered option A, and then we had, had talked about a possible connection here as option B. Um, option A was a little more difficult because we had to permit through some uh, potential wetlands, but uh, we dealt with the Army Corps, got that permit, and, um, and that path is under construction now. So um, that was the path and the location the town preferred, obviously, because it's right along Route 2. And we, and we were not successful to get that permit, but Lisa and somebody in the town got it done, and we, we told them we'd build it, so that's why we're doing that. Parking count that includes the new parking count includes the fact that you you had to put the bump out on the back row and the the trash cans out there and then those that we would bump out in the uh, right behind building B two you yes. put that in there that's that's still the correct count now yeah. correct yeah that parking count yeah okay. reflects those changes because I was sitting there going wow oh, a few a few spaces have disappeared since the last picture I saw. Okay, we're good. Where, where are the dumpsters for A2 and B2? Is that the, the back row there? Is there three dumpsters or two? Um, um, this is a, a set of dumpsters for the A2 building and a set of dumpsters for the B2 building. Um, I believe the set of dump, the B2 building is a double set. Mm -hmm. So trash and recycles? Yeah. What about composting dumpsters? Um, composting, um... If there's going to be restaurants, I would assume there'll be right. composting. Yeah, right. Another parking space gone. <laughs> parking yeah. Potentially. Um, you know, that's something we actually hadn't thought about, but... Usually, obviously usually those are smaller, yeah. and they yeah. empty them more frequently. We put a couple across the street at Town Farms, and they come two or three times a week because the smell doesn't... Uh, that's what I was get real good. I'm like, well, it's against the so back row here. We got residents yeah. back there, so it'll, it'll be smaller, but we can provide it inside that screen here. Anything else from the applicant's perspective? No, I just want to maybe add that the, I think you guys will be proud of what we build there. You'll like it. We're going to do a good job. It means a lot to us, too, right now. And we've worked hard with the town over a number of years, as you know. And we think we've got a pretty good project right now based on all the feedback from you guys, the hack, and working with staff. And we're pretty excited about this project right now. I think you'll be happy with it. What's the timing of the project? Uh, we've submitted our Act 250. In fact, uh, we just paid that this week. And we're, uh, we're a little bit lighter this week. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Hoping but to have all our, all our permits middle by middle in November. Um, community banks very anxious to close, and um, we both want to start in December. Yeah. So. The, 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 the B2 and the A2 buildings, we hope to start in December, and then follow it right across the street and continue with You're the You're going to start A1. phase two first? Yeah, yeah phase two is going to become phase one, other than the roads. Um, the bank has pushed us <laughs> so hard. And because of the construction being so close, we thought it was more efficient to uh, build our building so they can build their parking lot. <laughs> Is that, does that require any kind of amendment? The reversal and phasing? 
to the... Well, phase one will be under construction at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to throw any no. but Joe, I think loops phase, in here. Phase one includes all the site work that you, when you drive by that site, they're they're yeah. pretty far into... Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Buildings yeah. are kind of... That's the, next, that's the next piece of work is to start the foundations. We've got all the sewer water and storm water stuff all completed. We're working on the electrical right now. We've got part of the electrical system in for the, from the power company, and then we're going right to foundations after that. How deep do you plan that uh, little water pond to be? The water pond? Um, how deep is it? It's, uh, so that's built. It's, uh, yeah, there's a... It's, it's at the lowest point on the site, so you know, even though it might be 11 feet deep on where the buildings are, it may only be nine feet deep there because we, we lose two feet of elevation. But these guys will tell you the. And that's exactly. the storm water pond. The the storm water pond, yeah. Yeah, the bottom of that is at a 390. Uh, the bottom of the four bay, and the top of it is approximately 399.5. So what would so, the parking what would the parking lot say behind building B one B? The uh, edge of the parking lot there is a four o just under a four o one at the top of that retaining wall so, there. So you're looking at eleven, 11 feet. feet. Yeah. And again, it's um, sloped, so you lose about two feet. So it's probably only going to be about nine feet deep in the pond. Yeah, the wall it's itself the is. Yeah, the wall itself is five feet, and then it slopes down. Um, so it's not an 11-foot drop straight down. It's nothing that you'd want to do like a swan dive off. No, 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 no. I was just saying is that I was just saying is if it's steep enough, and if a kid falls in there, he, and he probably can't get back out, you're going to want to have at least some potentially something to say. Hey, he, he would he would be able to walk up the other side because the other side is completely sloped with no wall. Yeah, and you can walk a, out the back side. Excellent. Thank There's you. There's actually a path proposed along the top of right. that berm. Okay. okay. Good. What what was the what was done recently on Connor Way, right where it intersects with Maple Tree Place? Oh yeah. What, what, what's the purpose of that? I don't. It worries <laughs> me. Where were, where a, were you when we needed? Yeah, <laughs> that's horrible. That was uh, acquired by Public Works in the Select yeah, Board. Yeah. It was some traffic calming. Uh, what's, that, the, what, what's it intended to do? Because it's not going to do what it's slow intended. Slow the traffic down. Slow the traffic by traffic. making the well, it, it funnels you into a narrower area, so you, you either slow down or you have the potential of uh, hitting a curb. It's just you know, it's not a you know, the other thing if you go in and out of there, it's going to allow you to actually pull further out <coughs> past the grazer's truck to actually <laughs> see before you pull out onto the road and so you don't get smashed. We also had a few crosswalks there. But yeah, we put the electronic crosswalks in uh, so people can. So those, those are your those are your improvements part of this. Project. That's correct. Yeah. But I wasn't sure if they were going to widen anything. That's done. Just What's done the is sidewalks and in, in pedestrian ways is what all they've widened. They've narrowed the roads to, to do that. Yeah. We have stamp, to stamp concrete. Stamp concrete. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I was yeah, impressed yeah. how fast that went in. Yeah. I was impressed how fast that went in. Yeah. Yeah, well, we had a lot of people working yeah, well, against us to get that done. To keep for those of us who speed through there all the time, it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sign plan. Um, anybody have any last comments or? Are they going to get a chance to have more comments? Okay, we're going to close. We don't have any opposition. Yeah. You know, I had that thought, but I wasn't going to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we jinxed ourselves. <laughs> yeah, we got one more. <laughs> okay, we're going to close. No tonight. <laughs> we're going to close DP 16-05.2 uh, at 9:51, and we are going to immediately open. Uh, DP 20-12, which is a master sign plan for the same development. Yeah. Driving some of them away, huh? <laughs> yeah, send these guys home. It's bedtime. <laughs> like all the architects can leave. Yeah. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Al is sticking around though. <laughs> he loves a good master sign plan. <laughs>
Oh, no. yeah, thanks, thanks, Dave. <laughs> okay. Staff goes first. Um, this is a request for discretionary permit for a new master sign plan at Cottonwood Crossing. Um, proposed plan is for buildings A1, B1, A2, and A2 at Cottonwood Crossing. Uh, which are collectively all the buildings can expected to contain commercial uses within the project. Um, master sign plans are required in Williston for new or existing commercial buildings. In for a type of sign that can only be permitted under a master sign plan and for a greater number of signs or for signs that are larger in size and are allowed by Williston Development Bylaw 25A. Williston Development Bylaw 25.5 provides a mechanism by which a commercial site plan may gain approval for master sign plan. The applicant's proposing master sign plan because the site contains or could contain multiple commercial tenants. Um, I've included a table that shows um, a listing of the sizes and the number of um, those size signs. Um, WDB 25 allows a maximum potential amount of allowable signage under a master sign plan at 8% of the area of the street facing the elevation of the building on site. The applicant's proposal compares to that maximum as follows. Um, so the total area of the street facing building elevations is 37,809. Percentage of the building elevations, 8% uh, is the maximum percentage. Maximum potential sign area allowed is 3,000. 24 square feet, and the proposed sign area is 2,520 square feet. Um, staff notes that two street-facing facades of buildings A1, B1, A2, and B2 were used in determining the maximum site-wide allowed area. Um, and yeah, so the applicant has Proposed the use of more than one street facing facade to determine a maximum site wide allowance for sign area. This can be permitted, but only if the DRB is willing to make specific findings that allowing these signs is consistent with the Williston Comprehensive Plan and the intent of WDB Chapter 25. Um, and staff has drafted those findings below. Okay, thank you, Melinda. Uh, what do you have to add? Oh, well, so uh, the, to answer the question about um, about using both streets yes. in the calculation, um, that was how the board um, allowed it during phase one when we uh, had our phase one master sign plan approved in 2016. So I would just, we calculated the same way, assumed it would be done like that throughout the development. Okay. So this is, a, this is for phase two. This is just using the buildings in phase two. So, so you've got two separate master sign plans for this site? So I believe um, it's being considered one sign plan application for phases one and two. So there's five sheets total. Um, one's, one's like a site plan and then one for each building. And all four buildings in phases one and two are included in um, this table of proposed signage. So the 37,809 square feet of street facing building elevations is two sides of all four buildings. Yep. Well, um, uh, I'm sorry, well, not exactly. It's, um, well, um, yeah, I guess that, that is true. A, A1 has two sides, B1 has two sides, side and, a half. side and a half with the angle. A2 has two sides, and B2, yeah, has two sides. Has two or three, depending on how you count. Right. Side. Four. They're all cornering <coughs> intersections, so. And so each individual sheets two, three, four, and five show that um, measurement. Use the, get to the total square footage allowed. Now, didn't I hear about an hour and a half ago? You said potentially the reason that you wanted not to have the uh, 
Rick? Rick? Breaking up the line was because potentially a couple of those windows could all be one organization, right? Correct. Yes. So, you know, not knowing who's going in the building, we've proposed a lot of signage, but. Right. So, in other words, the signage count is the outright maximum single usage. Right. Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. And what we could potentially see is relatively less. Yep. You probably will see relatively less, but it gives, gives us options to right. put it anywhere on the buildings in them signed. No, I'm just, try, I'm just trying to get the idea is, what you're saying is, this is the worst case scenario, but potentially if some of those end up like double, double windows as one building, yes. one, one company, yeah. you actually have less square footage signing actually that we're gonna see. Not that, you're, not that you can't use them, but I'm just saying. That, that's correct. Okay. Exactly. But that, that company may take the maximum amount as well, but more than likely it'll be less. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the, Emily and Melinda, the, it talks about the sign, sign types not proposed, awning or projecting signs. How, do we, how does the town define a projecting sign? Is that like a bayonet sign that, that, that hangs on the side of a building? Uh, let's confirm before I give a wrong answer. And I only ask that because in a situation like you have, that can be a, an extremely effective. Projecting sign extends yeah. outward from the wall of a building. It may be perpendicular to the building wall or at an angle. It is a message intended to be read primarily by the people approaching for one or both signs. So, yeah. yeah. And if we find that the you know, tenants want that, we'll, we'll come in and try to, you know, we can. That would be an amendment to amendment. Amendment. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just know that in Montpelier, Yes. They've now put a lot of those on there, encouraging people to do that. It's actually quite nice as you're walking down the street to yeah. actually look up and know, oh, okay, yeah, there's yeah, the subway approach. Well, actually, subway didn't put one in, but right. so yeah. all the local stores did. Bookstore or something. Yeah. yeah. You know, the toy store or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I like right. that. So. It, it actually adds a lot of kind of life to that streetscape yeah. as you try to figure out, you know, because there's eight stores kind of lined up next right. to each other. Anyway, I just. If, if we find that we get a similar setting with multiple little tenants like that, you know, rather than maybe one tenant taking mm -hmm. half of the building, then we may we may come back in and see you guys for that. What about a directory sign? Any contemplation of that at this point? Um, we have the overall Cottonwood Crossing sign that's going to be at the, the corner of Cottonwood Drive and Wilson Road, but um, we haven't proposed like a building directory sign. We don't think that there'll be a, you know, an externally mounted directory sign at this point. But again, if we, if the tenants come to us and say we think it would be nice, then similar to the. We'll uh, see you. Yeah. You're right. That we'll would be an amendment. <laughs> we're kind of, we're kind of just getting some signage approved right now because we, we don't really know what the tenant base is going to be. And do you, for the standalone? Cottonwood Crossing sign. Are you proposing one at each, on each side, or no, just a single one? Uh, just just the one, one freestanding sign. Be on the A2 side. Yep. Okay, and then nothing where it come comes in on our way. No. The the one uh, the one that's on the Williston Road side will be, you know, two sided, but just with just one sign. Portable signs, are those going to be sandwich? You're going to hire people to do sandwich boards? Yep. Around. Yep, the sandwich boards. Just what, just what college kids need to do for the summer. Oh, no. no. Oh, you mean the suit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Everything in the no, sandwich just be a frame. Is this? We can't, no, we, we, we can't we want, we want you to. We want you to employ some of the Williston youth. That <laughs> <laughs> would be an amendment. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did notice amendment. one thing on your uh, sheet one. In your wall design under building A1. Yep. At the bottom it has A6 again, and I think it should be A16. On the bottom A. Um, Up in the legend. Oh. Legend. Oh, you're right. I see where I see where you caught that. Yeah, that's a typo. <laughs> yeah, I figured it was. Yeah. Yep. So that's uh, that's something we can uh, clean up for the final plan submittal. Thanks.
Anything else? John? No, no good. I'm exhausted. We uh, have exhausted master sign plan happens Ow. at 10 o'clock, so it's a quick review. Um, I'm going to close DP 20 12 at 10 04. All right, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, welcome back to the Williston, Town of Williston Development Review Board. Tuesday, October 8th, the DRB is out of deliberation at 10.44 p.m. Uh, do I have a motion on DP 18-06.1? Yes, I, Jill Spinelli, move that the Williston Development Review Board approve the final plans for DP 18-06 and authorize the applicant to file an administrative Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second. All seconds. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Uh, next up is DP 20 11, uh, Munson Drive Industrial Park. Is there a motion? As authorized by w WDB 6.6.3, .6 I, David Saladino, move that the Wilson Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards, required to comment on this application by the Wilson Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of October 8, 2019, the findings of fact and conclusions of law proposed by staff for the review of DP 20-11, and approve this discretionary permit subject to the conditions above with the one change uh, to condition of approval 2A to add at the end of the sentence uh, the following, uh, except for the requirement to replace the hammerhead turnaround with a cul-de-sac, period. Thank you, David. Is there a second? I'll second it. David Turner seconds. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Uh, next up, is there a motion for DP 16-05.1, Cottonwood Crossing Phase 1, Amendment 1? Yes, as authorized by WDB 6.6.3, .6 I, John Hemmelgarn, move that the Wilson Development Review Board Having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of October 8, 2019, and the findings of fact and conclusions of law proposed by staff for the review of the DP 16-05.1, and approve this discretionary permit subject to conditions above. This approval authorizes the applicant to file final plans, obtain approval of these plans from staff, and then seek an administrative permit for the proposed development, which must proceed in strict conformance with the plans on which this approval is based. We're going to make a couple of modifications to first the findings of fact number four. It will read phase one as approved includes 15 one bedroom dwellings and 31 two bedroom dwellings. The applicant is proposing a reduction in the number of one-bedroom dwellings from 15 to 9, and an increase in the number of two-bedroom dwellings from 31 to 33. We will change a couple of the conditions of approval. Uh, number two, we will strike the second sentence of that uh, and the part A. And we will uh, change condition number 22 to read the requirements for long-term bicycle parking and end-of-trip facilities are satisfied with the proposed long-term bicycle parking in each of buildings A1 and B1 and two end-of-trip facilities in building A1. We will delete number uh, condition number 23. We will uh, clarify condition number 24 to 
uh, limit or to um, to read, there shall be no maintenance or delivery activities that generate loud noise between the hours of 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. We'll delete the reference to 7 there. And that is it. I suppose we should renumber those last two conditions to, uh, based on the fact that number 23 was deleted. So. Okay. Thank you, John. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Paul seconds it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, next up is BP 16-05.2, Cottonwood Crossing, Phase 2. Is there a motion? Yes. As authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, David Turner, move the will to review the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and advisory boards required to comment on the application by the Williston Development Bylaw, <coughs> And having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of October 8, 2019, and the findings of fact and conclusions of law proposed by the staff for the review of DP 16.16-05.2, and approve this discretionary permit subject to conditions above, the approval authorizes the applicant to file final plans, obtain approval for these plans from staff, and then seek administrative permit for the proposed development which must proceed in strict conformance with the plans on which this approval is based. Um, we'll change some of the conditions. On condition number two, we're gonna strike 2A. Um, we'll strike condition number 23. And on condition 24, we'll change the hours of operation between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And condition 21, we'll change to proposed long-term bicycle parking in B2 with end of trip facilities in A1 meet the requirements. Thank you. Is there a second? Dave Saladino seconds it. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, motion carries. Is there a motion for DP 20-12, which is the Cottonwood Crossing Master Sign? It's authorized by WDB 663. I, Paul Christensen, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application materials submitted and all the accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards, required to comment on this on the testimony presented, Whoop. comment on the this application by the Wilson Unified Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of October 8, 2019, except the findings of fact, conclusions of law, conditions of approval proposed by the staff for the review of DP 20-12 MSP, and approve this discretionary permit for a master sign plan. This approval authorizes the applicant to submit final plans, obtain approval for these plans from the staff, and then seek an administrative permit for future development, which must proceed in strict conformance with the plans on which this approval is based. Uh, you can make a reference to that plan change. Oh, there is a note on um, the first picture. Uh, sheet, sheet one of five. Sheet one of five. And sheet one is, uh, there's an A1 that should be an A16. Is that correct? Yeah, there's a, there's a typo. There's a typo. There's a typo uh, what is the desig wall sign designation A6 at the bottom of the listing should actually read A16. Mm -hmm. I'm still having trouble with that one. I heard it, but I'm trying to. See, I don't see it on the on the. It's up in the table, up in the top right. Oh, it's up here. Up here, I think. It's right here. Oh. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Amendment. Uh, on the sheet one for building one on the wall sign list goes A one through A fifteen, and the last one says A six. 
which should be A16. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. John seconds it. Any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of September 24th, 2019? I'd like to move to that we approve the minutes of September 24th, 2019 as written. Second. I'll second it. Dave Turner seconds it. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. So. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.